In the U.S., we see inflation cooling. We see the economy slowing. Disinflation, it has been very consistent. The transmission of higher rates really didn't flow through with the normal four to six quarter lag that we were expecting. I think we're seeing the beginnings of an unraveling. We continue to think that the Fed is at a peak. We also continue to think that the Fed is going to be cutting interest rates next year. This is Bloomberg Surveillance with Tom Keen, Jonathan Farrell, and Lisa Abramowitz. Shutdown averted. Live from New York City this morning. Good morning, good morning for our audience worldwide. This is Bloomberg Surveillance on TV and radio alongside Tom Keane and Lisa Brabitz. I'm Jonathan Farrow. Your equity market pop off the back of the weekend's news. It's going absolutely nowhere. The S&P 500 almost totally unchanged. TK, a spike, and then it fades, and it fades quickly. It, it fades quickly, and we're back to an 18.12 on the VIX. I'm just watching the VIX as a thermometer here, but the correlation out to equities, bonds, currencies, commodities is really, really rich. And I just want to say the tea leaf for me on a Monday morning is I see Japanese yen just creeping. It's ever so slight, folks. It's just teens weeds. It's just a little bit of yen weakness. That's what I'm watching more than anything. Just short of 150 at the moment, Tom, 149.74. Lisa, we avoid the government shutdown for now. We'll get payrolls Friday data later this week. But ultimately, we're going to do this all over again in about a month, aren't we? Yeah, I can't wait until November when we get to uh, have this whole discussion again. We do have City's Andrew Holland Horace coming up this morning and saying that he does <coughs> believe that we're going to get some sort of resolution just like the one that we got uh, yesterday or over the weekend, rather. What I find interesting is that the threat of higher rates, the threat of a lack of economic weakness on the heels of a government shutdown is what's spurring some of the concern in markets today. All of a sudden, people are taking the bond move seriously. Hello, Q4. Should we go through the list of things? Things. Please. Energy prices, rates, student loan repayments resuming, TK. Apparently, this is the quarter. Not last quarter, the quarter before, but this is the quarter when this consumer finally begins to crack. Well, that's the basic theory. And then you talk to optimists, and there's a number of them out there who say, uh, no, you saw the angst in September. I, I had a great conversation with Neil Dutt. I believe it was on Friday on radio with Paul. And Neil just flat out reaffirmed the resiliency of the consumer, even with all the challenges. And he made clear this is not about 4% growth, it's two-ish. There are some companies speaking to weakness. The team here at Bloomberg did a fantastic job over the weekend of putting this story together. Lisa Carmax, Costco, JetBlue, Dunham Restaurants. Speaking to some weakness out there as well. Jane Fraser, City, talking about people with low credit scores. Starting to see some weakness there too. I wouldn't say it's absent. It's there. How big is it going to be and wh whether it grows through Q4, I think is the big question we've got to ask through this morning, through this week and through the rest of this month. Does it grow enough to reduce the inflationary pressure that's coming back up in certain areas? And I think that's one of the key questions at a time where the housing market is really uh, dealing with a lack of supply and where you have services prices that have really hung in there. So if you have this kind of inflationary pressure and weakness for some people, albeit real weakness, is it enough to, to achieve what the Fed is looking to achieve. Tons of data, a load of Fed speakers. Well, wow. Bramo's going to walk you through that in just a moment. Here's the price action at the moment. The S&P 500 was positive by about 0.6%. Then it fades. We're up now by just 0.06% and going almost absolutely nowhere. In the bond market, we're going somewhere. You know where that somewhere is at the moment. Yield higher by six basis points. Your 10 year, 463. Again, the dollar showing some strength. 11 weeks of strength against euro weakness has been absolutely phenomenal, TK. That currency pair, 105.37. In the beginning of the quarter, do we shift from a two year Fed analysis to a 30 year bond real economy analysis? The chart of the 30-year bond, it's just simple. It's breaking out the new highs. It's in the 470s. I think it's under-talked under about. At least for this under morning, 474 yields up four basis points at the long end. Yeah, and Deutsche Bank says the damage in bonds has been more severe and, sev and sustained than for equities. When is it going to actually cause something to break? 10 a.m., very curious to see uh, what we get from U.S. ISM manufacturing as well as prices yeah. paid, especially yeah. because we've yeah. had almost a year of contractionary readings from the ISM here. It's starting to inflect upward. And this is what I'm talking about yeah. when you have the kind of inflationary Brilliant. pressure in <clears throat> areas that have been in recession that are suddenly recovering. I never looked at this. Pharaoh taught me to look at this. And John, it's nonlinear. 50 is a center point, And from 50 to 49 is different than from 49 to 48. Every point 
matters. A line in the sand is 50, the difference yeah. between expansion and contraction. And Lisa, as we've discussed over the last several months, weakness in manufacturing, resilience in services. And the question we've asked, Miss Life Mateka over at JP Morgan, I think it's been good on this as well, is whether manufacturing comes up to services or services comes down to manufacturing. Now, the bearish people out there have been saying services will come down to manufacturing. What we've seen more recently is maybe manufacturing starting to lift, which I guess is the point you're making going into this data point. Especially given the fact that Chinese economic data seems to be on the margins rebound just a touch at 10 a.m. We hear from J.P. Morgan CEO Jamie Dimon, who's going to be speaking with Bloomberg's Emily Chang at the J.P. Morgan Techstars Forum in London. Curious if he re reiterates what we heard from Jane Frazier uh, last week. And today, Tom, this is just for you. The Fed speak lineup includes 11 a.m. Fed Chair Jay Powell and Philadelphia Fed uh, President okay. uh, Patrick Harker. We have 1.30 uh, p.m., New York Fed President John Williams reprising his speech from last week that he had to miss. At 7.30 p.m., Cleveland Fed President Loretta Mester. Will any of them say anything to give the market any conviction you, when they basically are looking at a lot of uncertainty and data dependency? I'm going to say four heavyweights today. Do you think they compare notes? Do they have, like, a conference call? Does their staff have a conference call beforehand? Well, you'd have to imagine that the views of Williams are closely aligned to the views of yeah. Powell. And Williams, I think, has been outspoken on issues that Powell doesn't really want to engage in, particularly around our star and the long-term neutral rate and all of that stuff as well. It's interesting, isn't it? It is. Powell won't talk about cuts, but Williams will give you why they might deliver cuts down the road. I wonder if he feels bad about doing that and having that be the focus or if that's actually he wants to be the front leader when it comes to having this discussion. They're kind of in a no-win situation, and I wonder how much they've lost the plot. Do people actually listen to these speeches and really parse through? You can turn up and ask some questions today. Okay. You do that. Is, he actually, is this actually the speech from Friday that he's just going to deliver today? No, he actually did release it. He's speaking uh, at a different speech at 7.30 p.m. He, okay. did, he actually did release the text of that no, speech. No, I read the text of that speech. Yeah, yeah. I was just wondering whether he was going to turn up in person and just read it. I think this is in New York City. Okay, the other right. one was in Long Island. All right, good to know. <laughs> Laurie Cavassini joins us now, head of U.S. equity strategy at RBC Capital Markets. Laurie, what if I have you with us on the program to kick off this trading week? There's a line in your recent note. We aren't convinced this is the end of the current period of equity market weakness. Laurie, why is that? Well, I, I think that basically what we did with the government shutdown is we took one of a number of different issues that have been weighing on market short term off the table. And we only took it off the table for, you know, maybe a month and a half or so. We'll see how long it lasts. Um, but I think, you know, we always look at these kind of episodes in markets and say, where was sentiment? And I don't think sentiment got bad enough last week to serve as any kind of big springboard. So we were looking at some of the commentary that was coming out over the weekend saying, you know, it's time to buy. We're in the clear. And so, well, this thing has just been kicked down the road. There's still a lot of other stuff we're going through. And sentiment just never got that bad. We just really we saw concern come back last week. We didn't see fear. And if you look at the AAII survey, net bulls got down to about minus 13 percent on the weekly data point, but the four-week data point, the four-week average was about flat. You contrast that with back around the SVB period, we were at minus 20% right. or worse for four weeks in a row. So we're, we're just not anywhere near the same kind of uh, point where we can say, okay, it's so bad, we got to go higher from here. Lori, once again, small caps disappoint. I have a chart I keep of the NASDAQ 100, granted it's seven or eight super stocks. Maybe they're Dow stocks, but we don't want to admit it and the Russell 2000, and it's a chart of failure. What should these companies do if they can't get value from the market? Should they go private? Should they merge? Should the zombies go away? Well, I think there's always going to be, you know, sort of that zombie element in the Russell 2000. I, I don't think they're going to, you know, disappear anytime soon. Um, I do think that we have to keep an eye out to see whether or not there's more M&A activity that comes up, um, particularly in an area, say, like the industrial space, where we, we often hear from small cap portfolio managers that quality of management and quality of businesses is quite high. So I think that's one thing that we can look at. Um, I, I think, frankly, small caps just have a problem at this point in time after that last Fed meeting, because while I do think 2024 cuts are still on the horizon, that's still the call of our rate strategy team. I think there's starting to be some doubts about how many cuts, about when. And that was really the catalyst, I think, that small caps needed to really get going. And it seems like it's been damaged. I think we're also just in an air pocket of economic uncertainty right now. And small caps, I think, also needed to see incremental enthusiasm about the 2024 economy emerge. And instead, we've gotten the return of uncertainty in here. Lori, a couple of months ago, you came on and you expressed caution, but said you were not bearish, that you did see uh, equities muddling through 
Am I hearing that you are more bearish now after seeing where bond markets are, how high yields are, the fact that uh, that, that, that yield cuts, that, that rate cuts are not being priced into the market, maybe shouldn't be priced into the market for next year? No, I think, you know, our head is still really where it was at the beginning of August, that we've got some short term issues that we've got to work through. We've had a tremendous run in the market this year. I would say, though, you know, there's definitely a camp of strategists out there, right, who are who are you know very much in the doom and gloom camp for next year. And I wouldn't put me in that camp by any stretch. I do, you know, sort of subscribe to what you guys were alluding to as the Neil Duda view earlier of kind of the resiliency of the consumer. I just think we're not going to get a lot of information about that in the here and now. Companies seem to have planned up and they're frankly not saying anything that's all that useful, whether you're looking at conferences or the last round of earnings reports. And I think that's a problem when you've had the year like we've had, doubts are starting to creep and about the economy again. And we're not getting a lot of stars to navigate by at this point in time. I think the interesting point about this moment, Laurie, is that unlike through the most rest of this year, consumer discretionary is starting to crack. The equity market is starting to show some real weakness there. The story of the year has been consumer discretionary has really performed and performed quite strongly. What do you take away from the weakness we're seeing in the equity market for discretionary recently, Laurie? And whether you see that as a buying opportunity, have we discounted enough going into Q4? I think it depends on what part of consumer discretionary you're talking about. You know, we talked a little bit about small cap earlier, small cap consumer discretionary stocks, which do tend to, you know, sort of migrate more to the lower end. They're more domestically focused. They priced in a recession last year. The big cap S&P 500 consumer discretionary stocks did not. And while valuations don't look terrible right now, they haven't been looking cheap at any point in our model over the last year, year and a half. Um, so we think the risk reward there is not fantastic. And then, you know, we talked a little bit about higher bond yields. Um, that's really, I think, probably one of the biggest problems we're dealing with. And the problem is that it traditionally, if you look in a post GFC world, the sectors that do most poorly when bond yields are rising are things like consumer discretionary communication services, kind of those growthier parts of yeah. the market. So you've got a sector that didn't ever get cheap enough. Economic angst is rising. And you've got this bond yield negative catalyst hitting all of, you know, kind of hitting right. at precisely the wrong time. Uh, Lori, James Diamond is going to get all the press today. He's going to do chit chat with Emily Chang in London. Great. It's all going to be, you know, the usual big bank stuff. The BKX chart is a train wreck. Are the banks the mother of all value traps here? You know, it's interesting. Financial should be outperforming in a higher bond yield environment. They're not doing that right now, um, not, to, not to the extent that they should be anyway. And we're seeing, you know, energy has really kind of sucked, you know, some of the, the benefit uh, that the other parts of the value trade would see. I think it depends on your time horizon. You know, I, I do like financials in the S&P. We're overweight. We have said we like energy better. You're do, you are seeing a nice revisions recovery if you look at the bank space in particular, but we haven't quite crossed over into positive revision territory. Things have just been getting less negative. I do often find that when you see earnings revisions turning, but they're not quite in positive territory yet, you still have a lot of doubters in the trade, and that's often a good opportunity to come in. I think there's money to be made here long term, but I do think you have to have a stronger stomach. And there, frankly, may be other parts of the value trade that just don't have as much hair on them. Hey, Laurie, thank you. Good luck for the rest of this week. Laurie Cavassini there of RBC Capital Markets. What a quarter we leave behind in Q3. Ten-year yield higher by more than 70 basis points. And to your point, TK, real feeling, just eyeballing this. Look at what's happened with yields. Look at what hasn't happened with financials. Yeah. It looks like this year higher yields hurt. Banks don't help them. That's been the story so far. And that's been, you know, some people will say, well, that's not what's in the textbook, but I think we're not in a textbook at uh, time. And what's so important here, folks, looking to Q4 and your beliefs, which are going to try to help you with good conversation, is a basic idea of ambiguity. Every single narrative we talk about can cut two ways. When you overlay 30 narratives on top of each other, it becomes a toxic brew. A toxic brew. That's where we are. A Bramo Q4 brew. Is a Elisa Laurie made the point that she doesn't think the weakness is over. Just to be clear, if you were waking up this morning, just tuning in, welcome, and you thought we'd get a decent pop off the back of avoiding a shutdown, equities are now negative on the session, Bramo. Equity futures just turning negative. I thought it was amazing what Deutsche Bank's Jim Reed said. You can't have this much value destruction in bonds without there being some stress somewhere. Where is that stress going to show up? It's going to be a big, big New focus for us through this week. Hey, the mess has been bad. That's a low blow. About the Jets. Show it's a perennial the issue. <laughs> End of the season. Are we talking about Tears. the Chiefs later? Yeah, we'll do that. Taylor Swift and all of that good stuff. I, I, all right. you know, I, I had to leave in the third quarter. <laughs> <laughs> Looking ahead to payrolls Friday, tons of data and a little bit of Fed speak. In fact, a whole lot of Fed speak from New York. Good morning.
All eyes turn to the U.S. job market. The jobs report, it beckons. It looks like companies are just holding on, holding on, holding on to workers. What you see is what you get. We're seeing a lot of strength. This Friday, Tom, Jonathan, Lisa, and Mike will bring you crucial data and expert analysis at terminal speed. This is exactly what the Fed is looking for. They now believe you can get back to 2% without damaging the labor market at all. We might get a bigger whammy than we expected. The September Jobs Report, Friday on Bloomberg Television and Radio. Last night, Congress passed uh, the spending bill that's going to keep the government open. And it's good news for the American people, there shouldn't be another crisis. There's no excuse for another crisis. Consequently, I strongly urge my Republican friends in Congress not to wait. Don't waste time as you did all summer. Pass a year-long budget agreement. Honor the deal we made a few months ago. Stop the games. The president of the United States, a stopgap funding bill that will take us to November 17th, but lacking the aid for what HEMA ultimately wants, which is the aid for Ukraine. Much more on that story in just a moment. Your equity mark on the S&P 500, totally unchanged. We're going absolutely nowhere on the S&P. You do not get that spike that you were looking for. In the bond market, yields are higher by five basis points, 462.48 on a 10-year currently. In foreign exchange, the dollar showing some strength, the euro some weakness. We've had 11 weeks of this, just absolutely remarkable. The resilience of the US dollar, the weakness in the euro for more than two months, 105.38 on that currency pair. Jordan Rochester, Namora, a little bit later, 102 is what he's looking for in the near term. Want to look at crude briefly, TK 91.68 up here by about 1%. Ed Morse, City, thinks we can head back down to the 70s. Yeah. That's making some news. A bit of a splash from City this morning on that, going back to the 70s next year. This is percolating around the certitude of greater demand to EM and the move up and the sustaining 100 and even as higher up to 120. And Daniel Jurgen, in that important conversation with Youssef this morning in Abu Dhabi, really talked about the overestimation of demand coming on, as you hear from Dr. Morse. Here's the quote. Demand looks constrained as the pandemic recovery factors continue to ease off. They go on to say, and peak transport fuel demand looms while supply is growing in non-OPEC plus suppliers. That's ultimately the call, Tom, coming from Ed Morrison City this morning. Bearish crude. Yeah, bearish crude. And, of course, that folds into all of our efforts here for energy independence in the United States. On a Monday morning, as we recalibrate not only for fourth quarter and for 2024, it is timely to talk of some of the themes maybe a bit removed from what we do every morning. We do this with the United States Undersecretary for State for Economic Growth, Energy and the Environment, Jose Fernandez joins us this morning. Mr. Undersecretary, thank you so much for joining uh, Bloomberg. You know, I've, I've really got to say that Lisa Bramwitz and John Farrell have some important and timely questions on lithium and the rest. I just need a panda update. When do we get pandas back at the Washington Zoo? You were directly involved in these negotiations where China, I guess, correctly took the pandas back to Chengdu and all they've done to save these beautiful animals But what's the plan for the second term of the Biden administration to place pandas appropriately in Washington? Tom, uh, I'm sorry to see the pandas go. They were great ambassadors. They were some of the best ambassadors sent by the PRC to the United States. So I'm sorry to see them go. But look, our our relationships with China are, are, uh, as as we've talked about several times, it's about competition when we have to compete. It's about calling them out on some of the concerns that we have in their their market practices, in their human rights practices, and in their intellectual property practices. And we're going to continue doing that. Having said that, you're talking about a country that is one of our largest trading partners. So we also have to work with them as well. But I'm sorry to see the pandas go. One of our practices, and I know you did this in inorganic chemistry at Dartmouth, is we're losing lithium to China. The fact is front and center in our technological battle are these rare minerals. What is the to-do plan to help the United States participate in the mining, the distribution, and the use of those minerals? Tom, from day one of the administration, uh, President Biden uh, has talked about the need for us to diversify our critical minerals. And you're right. We have a need, and that need in lithium is probably the largest need that we have. According to the IEA, we're going to need 42 times the amount of lithium that we use today. uh, By 2050, we're going to reach our goals. Right now, 
Um, two thirds of that is either uh, processed or mined by China. So we have this need, we have a vulnerability. What we've done is uh, one of the many things we've done about this is to create a, the mineral security partnerships. 13 partner countries plus the EU working together to share information about mining uh, and processing to invest jointly to work on recycling, which is going to be about 10% of the EV battery content uh, in, in about 10 years, according to the IEA. And we're going to do this uh, observing the highest ESG principles because what countries are telling us uh, is that they do not want to choose between economic growth and environmental degradation. And we need to find ways to work with communities, with countries, so that they benefit from these kinds yeah, of investments, but, but Lisa, and that's what to we me, aim the, to do with the MSP. Lisa, the heart of the matter here is, is China going to play by the rules as just stated by the Undersecretary? Well, that's one sure of the issues. That. The other issue, Mr. Undersecretary, is it's uh, probably difficult to present the view of the United States when it mm. is so hotly contested and we're dealing with strikes right now that really go to the core of some of the electric vehicle policies that we have in place. How difficult has it been to represent the U.S.'s view when the policy is sort of unclear and being contested by workers at home? So... There is great interest on the part of producing countries. I've been to several countries that are, that are talking to us about critical minerals cooperation. Uh, Democratic Republic of the Congo, um, Zambia in, in Africa, Chile, Argentina, and, and so on. There is great interest. And no one is questioning our commitment, the Biden administration's commitment to clean energy. The IRA, the Inflation Reduction Act, is one is the latest example of that and we will continue to pursue these clean energy policies do you think that it makes the u.s more secure or less secure in a world that still is very much tied to oil as we have seen consistently uh, and when some of the production of the tools that go into electric vehicles have been tied to uh, governments that aren't necessarily ones that are long-standing relationships with the u.s and where the environmental practices of extracting those minerals is in question Look, we have, to, we have to work on our vulnerabilities, no question about it. And it's not only having to do with critical minerals. You, you, you see the same or similar vulnerabilities in the case of vaccines, uh, in the case of semiconductors. We all have vulnerabilities. We're working together with Europe uh, in, in, with men, in many of those vulnerabilities. In the critical mineral space, I will tell you that we have uh, uh, entered into, into conversations with many countries that want U.S. investment, and there is interest on the part of, of, of U.S. companies and companies elsewhere to work in these countries. So this is a, for the, in the critical mineral space, this is, this is a once in a generation opportunity for countries to actually use their resources and to do so in a way that's responsible and that benefits their people. Jose, thanks for the update this morning. We appreciate it. Jose Fernandez there, the U.S. Undersecretary of State for Economic Growth, Energy and the Environment. Lisa, every conversation we have at the moment on this particular topic, underlying thing, just how difficult it is to make this transition at the moment, throwing the UAW negotiations into the mix as well. There's nothing easy about this. And then throwing a government shutdown <laughs> to boot, and you sort of wonder where is the, uh, the emphasis at a time where there's a huge disagreement around how quick this transition is going to be and exactly right. where the investment is going to come from. My challenge here to the Undersecretary's good comments is their comments made in this righteous vacuum. They've got a theory, they've got a plan, and I don't see out there other nations really voicing the same theory as the United States. They're just like, get me the lithium. Well, you know, Europe's, Europe's struggling to come example. up with its own plan. Yeah. And clearly there's some tension there as well, Tom, about what's happening in Europe that. at the moment. Yeah. I, I, you know, when we were in London, we got a real eyeball on this with the electric... The, the uh, EVA, I can't I don't even know what the right word is, the EV force that you saw in the United Kingdom. And the, and the answer to me is, I, I wonder how alone we are on this debate. We've got to push ahead to payrolls. Payrolls Friday just around the corner. Mike Dada of Roth MKM Partners is going to be joining us very shortly. Payrolls on Friday, TK. We thought maybe we might not get the data on Friday if we had a government shutdown. We know we will get that data now. What are we looking for? on Friday, TK. I'm looking for a jobs report that moves the market, and I'm not sure it will because everybody's going to stagger to the inflation report. Frankly, with Jamie Dimon speaking to us today, Jamie Dimon's earnings report maybe has just as much weight as the jobs report. October 13th yeah. for Jamie Dimon's earnings report. 165 is the estimate for payrolls on Friday. Live from New York City, this is Bloomberg.
Coming off the back of four weeks of losses on the S&P 500. Down on the week, down on the month, down on the quarter. Let's get Q4 going. Equity futures totally unchanged on the S&P 500. Where is your post-weekend pop? Government shutdown averted. No one cares. Nasdaq futures positive by 0.2%. In the bond market, huge moves on the quarter, on the month, on a 10-year, up by more than 70 basis points on a 10-year yield through 3Q. Just unbelievable. We kick off Q4, moving higher by six basis points, 462.89. On a 10-year, on a two-year, up by six basis points to 5.1%. Tom, your eye right on a 30-year, long end of the curve, yeah. up four basis points, 474 on a 30-year in America. I'm going to do that in every country as well. I'm going to look 10 out to 30s in the UK, Europe, and particularly in Japan, because out there there's no YCC. There's no experiment, a toxic brew of economic theory, as you've got in the short side. But in America, and I haven't even looked, John, let me do it right now. You can do this on the Bloomberg Professional uh, Service, bank rate 30. Lisa taught me this. Uh, and I'm enjoying 7.74% with a 10-year and a 30-year up, up, and away. I'd suggest you're doing your best to avoid that. Yeah. I think most people are at the moment, Bramo. That's the story at the moment for bonds. Equities down for four weeks, yields higher for four weeks. The dollar coming off the back of its strongest quarter of the year so far. 11 weeks of euro weakness and dollar strength, taking a euro down to 105.35. We're negative here by 0.3%. That's some dollar strength. And here's some dollar strength too. Dollar yen, 149.69, very, very closely to here to 150, positive by 0.2%. Back end of last week, BOJ had a little nibble at the Japanese government bond market, threatening to do a little bit more. It's going to be on Wednesday, supposedly, that there's going to be another bond purchasing operation, the five to 10 year denomination in Japan. This would be their fourth unscheduled bond buying operation since July. And it comes at a time where, and you've highlighted this really well, there's a push pull with the currency and the bond market, and they are moving at odds with one another. If they support the bond market, they're basically going to weaken the currency. If they weaken the currency, they're going to lead to a higher bond yields. They are kind of reaching an end game and how much they want to tweak around the edges to make something more palatable that feels like it's increasingly unsustainable. Do you suppose it's too early to draw conclusions about what their preference is, what their priorities are, based on the fact they've come in to support the bond market before they've come in to support foreign exchange? I don't know. That is the answer. I don't know. It seems to me like they're just kind of like spinning plates. They're like, all right, over here, like over here, we're going to try to figure this out and keep things just kind of here and not moving too quickly before they can really come to some sort of true set policy. It's almost like they're biding time. And I don't know that they're choosing one or the other. They're just kind of trying to play them off each other. Strategic ambiguity, maybe. <laughs> Japanese <laughs> policy, something like that. <laughs> I think so. If there's a strategy there, I've got no idea if there actually is. Under surveillance this morning, the U.S. government avoiding a shutdown after approving a stopgap measure that will keep Keep it funded until November 17th, despite the deal. The pressure remaining on House Speaker Kevin McCarthy, with Florida Congressman Matt Gates telling ABC he'll file a motion to remove McCarthy from his position this week. The politics of the Republican Party, Tom, in the House in Washington. I think it's politics. I read very carefully the work. I'm sure Emory Horton and Joe Matthew were uh, over this. And all I can say is we will advance the conversation. We've got an important balance of power. Uh, this evening that will really address the urgency here of comparing Kevin McCarthy of Bakersfield with John Boehner of Ohio. The Congressman Gates sitting down with Bloomberg, Sam Marie and Joe Matthew a little bit later on this afternoon, 5 p.m. Eastern time. Don't miss that. AMH in the next hour is going to run us through what that interview might sound like. I want to get to the BOJ story. Mentioned it briefly, announcing an extra bond buying plan as it looks to curb sharp increases in yields. Japanese sovereign yields have been rising as speculation grows that the central bank is moving closer to ending its negative interest rate policy. Maybe at the end of the year, but ultimately, who knows? What is foreign is seeing a Japanese 10-year yield close to zero. 0.8%. I want to finish on this. Student loan repayments resuming this month for millions of Americans for the first time since payments were halted at the start of the pandemic. Around 40 million Americans collectively owe more than 1.6 trillion in student debt, leading to concerns that the resumption of repayments could hit discretionary consumer spending. Discretionary stocks have been hammered coming into Q4. Lisa, we know there was a 12-month on-ramp but you start thinking about it, you start acting ahead of time, you put it together with energy, with rates. Is this going to be a tough quarter for the consumer? There was a school of thought that the consumer just wouldn't pay, that they've gotten so used to not paying and freebies that they're going to not pay and that you're going to just see it delayed 12 months out because they have that grace period. But what anecdotal has sh data has shown is actually the opposite, that people, to your point, John, have started paying early and that they've started to come in. So it raises a question, have we already seen the punch from this? Is it going to be a pullback in discretionary 
spending or just more discretion, right? Buying this, but not that. I mean, this is the reason why it's such a confusing moment. They're not falling off a cliff. They're just changing their patterns just a little bit. We've said it repeatedly. We started every quarter this year with the same thing. The Economist who cried recession. You don't see one, you get to Q4 and you're like, oh, we've heard this before. I'm just going to ignore it. Keep selling treasuries. Are we actually going to start to see some weakness, Tom, in the labour market I, data? Start to see some real weakness in retail sales? Even Bloomberg's surveillance is data dependent. The retail sales, I'm glad you bring it up. My head's spinning. I, I don't know what to make of it. I, I, I really, I guess there's a consumer slowdown, but I got a lot of smart people saying, uh, oh, depends where not. you look, you know, who you listen to. I don't, I, don't, I just don't know. I'll just give you this anecdote story out this morning that auto sales actually yeah. increased in the past month. Despite everything that we've yeah. been talking about that's hitting the car sector, you start to wonder, even including the loans, that where rates have gone up as much as they have. So where is that weakness? And, and let me bring this in because it gets to our next guest. Neil Shearing over at Capital Economics with Roger Boodle writes a larger allegiant note this morning. And he talks about our considerable opportunities of looking at the themes, the gloom, the toxic brew that's out there. And he's just saying, yeah, okay, it's out there, but look at the opportunities we have within technology and global trade. Another brick in the wall, Tom, student loan repayments. The wall of worry. Yeah, I, I gotta put the surveillance cork in the mouth on it. This, this started with Bill Clinton years ago and we'll, see how, it, we'll see how it works out. Never with a cork in his mouth is Michael Darda Chief Economist, Macro Strategist, Dog Keeper for Roth MKM, just back from Japan, which is always a good and wonderful thing. Michael Darda, in your political economics, what did you learn in Tokyo and Kyoto? Well, Tom, we were there on, on Pledge or Not Business. Um, it, you know, incredibly beautiful cities, majestic if you're talking about Kyoto. And for people that have never experienced it, I mean, in Tokyo, imagine a city three times the size of New York City with essentially no litter, no crime, and almost no one even disobeying traffic lights. I mean, it's it's quite a trip. You have to experience right. it firsthand really to believe it, frankly. They are imputing inflation into their system. Some would say they're inventing an inflation. Do you see any historical analog that any country can manage inflation higher successfully? Well, sure, Tom, if you believe in the power of the central bank, and that's essentially what's happening. The discussion earlier, you know, Lisa really hit it on the head. The problem for the BOJ is that they can't hit two targets with one arrow. So if you're gonna effectively peg an interest rate, uh, you can't at the same time peg the currency or even, um, you know, control the price level. Um, you know, perfectly. So, you know, what's happening is they've got to adjust the, you know, the rate pegs based on macroeconomic conditions. It's different in the sense that typically central banks, you know, will target the, you know, the short policy rate in Japan because of the zero lower bound situation. They're targeting a long term interest rate. But the same basic concept applies. Mike, if we do get some sort of abandonment of yield curve control or the Bank of Japan losing the plot, losing control, losing the narrative when it comes to controlling bond yields and controlling the depreciation of the yen, how much does that accelerate the move up in U.S. yields that we've seen as we see just yields globally rise and maybe some of those buyers from over in Japan step away from the U.S. market? Yeah, it's an interesting situation. I mean, if you look at what's happened in the U.S. bond market, we've had a huge real rate shock. So this isn't really an inflation expectation story. So you do have, you know, movement in global yields on the back of, you know, central banks trying to persist in a, in a tighter policy regime. But it's really driven by real interest rates. Inflation expectations uh, in the U.S. have really barely budged. So crude oil prices are spiking higher coppers rolling over and Fed rate hiking expectations, or if you look at, let's say the 36 month Fed funds futures yield, it's moved up 150 basis points since the, the spring of this year. So that really accounts for the entirety, more than the entirety of the, the rise in the 10 year yield. So it's a higher for longer trade based on the back of perceived economic resilience um, in, this, in the states and the fact that you know, the Fed's reaction function is to make sure that growth slows below trend. So if it, you know, if it looks like that's not happening, then they're going to persist for a longer period of time. Mike, there are a lot of questions over the weekend about why something hasn't broken, given how quickly rates have rised, given how quickly benchmark yields have rised. Do you see any evidence, either in the economy or in the markets that you track, that shows that something is breaking? Well, you know, I think 
the reason something hasn't broken yet is the strength of the cyclical upswing that, that we've had coming out of the COVID shock has been much more robust than what we've seen historically, especially relative to the last cycle. So with that, you're going to have a higher neutral interest rate. And with a higher neutral interest rate, it'll simply take longer before things start breaking. So you can have more central bank tightening before things fall apart. There also may have been some temporary factors that you know, have held things up this year. Uh, there's been a very strange uh, explosion in the fiscal deficit at a time of full employment. You know, that is probably also feeding into the higher for longer strategy on the part of the Fed. Um, so those, you know, those factors matter. But the critical element here is, you know, nominal growth is slowing. Nominal GDP growth is slowing on the back of tighter Fed policy gross domestic income in nominal terms, even if you adjust for Fed losses, has essentially decelerated to trend or below trend mm -hmm. growth. Here you have the Fed, you know, with policy rates up at five and a quarter to five and a half, and they may move up further. So I think in terms of something breaking, that could still be in front of us. There, there's a perception that we've successfully soft landed, uh, but those kinds of discussions right. are, are pretty common prior to business cycle peaks and recessions. So we're not quite yeah. out of the woods just yet. Michael, uh, first day of Q4 primer. What is the signal of disinversion? If 210 spread is 100 pre and misra basis points and we reverse and we start to disinvert towards normal, what is the signal of that? Well, you don't get meaningful and sustained disinversions without the front end of the year yield curve coming down. You know, which would, would happen in a slower growth recession scenario with the Fed cutting interest rates. Um, you know, it certainly would be possible, at least theoretically, for the long end to just keep rising in the curve to disinvert. But that's actually pretty unusual historically. The last time we saw anything even close to that was actually 2007. And within a few months, we were actually in one of the longest, deepest recessions in history. So, you know, this inverted yield curve structure. Uh, backdrop that we have, I think, is a real warning sign in terms of the sustainability of the business cycle. And, you know, uh, I think a bit of cold water in terms of getting too excited about any kind of sustained growth acceleration. Mike, some real confusion for me, at least at the moment. I hear lots of confidence to why yields can go lower, but I feel that I hear little conviction as to why they're higher. Mike, I don't know how you can make the call for the former without an understanding of the latter. Mike, why are yields up so much at the long end? How much of this is just about budget deficits in Washington? Yeah, I think a combination of forces, John. Obviously, the economy has been more resilient than anticipated this year. Uh, and you do have this strange fiscal policy in environment uh, where the fiscal deficits exploded to levels really never seen outside of wartime when you're at full employment. And so the Fed's higher for longer strategy has been self-actualized by the bond market. You know, we can see the move up uh, in real yields is going basically step for step with that 36-month Fed fund futures implied yield. So that's the higher for longer trade. Uh, but that can also be unwound. You know, this has happened over the course of this, this year, over the last six months, really. Uh, and with softer data going forward, uh, that, you know, that trade can be unwound. So I think we know why it's happening. The question is, you know, what is the forecast going forward and will that forecast be accurate? Mike, thanks for the insight, buddy. As always, Mike Dada there of Roth MKM on this bond market. Yields aren't falling this morning, that's for sure. They're up six basis points, 463, 30 year, up four basis points. Your 30 year yield, 474. Curious, isn't it, Bramo, that you get that post shutdown averted pop in equities and it fades? And then you get that post shutdown averted pop in yields and it doesn't fade at all. It sticks. It's good news, bad news. I don't want to say it because I'm going to get eviscerated, no, I mean, but that's I exactly what we're heading. Yeah, I mean, that's basically that's what, what we're Matt looking at right now. That's what Matt is going to say to Joe Matthew this <laughs> afternoon. Well, good news, Joe, bad it's good news, news bad news. <laughs> Jordan Rochester, Namura on foreign exchange up next on why he thinks this euro can get closer and closer to parity against the US dollar. That's next. This is Bloomberg. sort of just throws us back to the biggest driver of all, which is this huge rise in Treasury yields as the vigilantes take over, because the one thing that's not going to stop is Treasury issuance. We're going to have to find the clearing price for all these bonds and notes. And, yep. um, and, and if, if, we, if the next place we go is, is 460 on a 475 on a 10-year note, then the dollar's going up.
Dollars going up right now. Kitju, Sokchen, let's check out the market for you. The euro, 11 weeks of weakness against a stronger dollar. Right now, euro dollar, about 105, 105.41. That currency pair negative by 0.3%. Jordan Rochester of Namora calling for euro dollar to hit 102 by year end with, quote, the potential to reach parity if energy prices continue to climb. Looking out to 2024, here's the view. We expect Fed cuts to provide euro with some relief, allowing it to climb back towards 110. So we're somewhere in between, Tom, right now. At 105, yeah. what's next? Parity, or are we going back to 110? Jordan thinks we get closer to parity before we look up. This is the real world where it's not pontificating big figure moves. It's about actually putting capital at risk and having a trading ban and measuring the support and the resistance of any given trading ban, whether it's Euro. Joining us on Jordan Rochester, G10 FX strategist at Nomura. What I see, Jordan, this morning that is absolutely distinct is finally Swiss franc gives way to stronger Swiss franc. It's ever so slight, but that's a distinctive tea leaf. Link Euro trajectory with the symbolism of a stronger Swiss franc to come. Indeed, Tom. I think last week's weakness in Swiss franc was a lot to do with month end as well. It's a lot of moves last week were to do with that month end flow because of the equity sell off that we had. But when it comes to the sort of view on Swiss and, and stocky and all those sort of local uh, euro area currencies, Swiss is one of those currencies where in a global slowdown, it tends to strengthen. It's still got a banking repatriation flow as well. So if you think the euro area is going into a recession, which we do, that is usually to the Swiss be uh, franc's benefit. You've still got a central bank that is also intervening in the FX market as well. 11 billion euros uh, per, per month of in FX intervention to strengthen their currency. So even though we think the S&B is done with rate hikes, because of the imp impending global slowdown, the potential for recession risks pretty much in Europe and the US, it's very hard to be selling the Swiss franc. Okay, sell Swiss franc, I'll go with that, but then I got the euro. What is the appropriate pair to play weaker euro? Well, we're looking at it this morning. I mean, the view for us is euro dollar and euro CAD. Uh, I think euro dollar towards uh, 102 towards parity is very possible as long as oil prices don't find a way to collapse. In the previous uh, guest you had on Kit Jukes, he was talking about US yields rising higher. Well, US rates suggest that euro dollar should be at 101 to 103 already. And if oil gets to $100 a barrel to $110 a barrel, it's very easy for the euro area to see their, their currency weaker because they are an energy importer. The problem for all of us this year in euro, as the chart shows you, it's been a, a zigzag, up, down, up, down, up, down. And this looks to be finally an exit of that range bound price action. This looks to me more like a trend now. Uh, it's a bit of deja vu to last year. Last year, Euro broke through parity thanks to Vladimir Putin, natural gas supplies being squeezed. This year, it's more thanks to what's going on in the Middle East with the lack of oil supply. And that's going to help the Euro get towards those sort of figures. The main risk is if the US data starts to come in soft and US yields stop climbing. But I think we've had a bit of good luck in that respect for this week, at least. US government shutdown has been avoided, which means that we're going to get non-farm payrolls. We're going to get the jolts data. And crucially, we're not going to get all those government workers laid off. It's going to be really difficult for the market to buy the dollar with initial uh, claims, jobless claims, spiking higher on Thursday. Well, that shouldn't happen now, thanks to that government shutdown being avoided. Jordan, we've got a natural bias here to ask questions about the US dollar. U.S. rates, Federal Reserve, the U.S. economy. You touched on the international story. Can you help us understand how important that is? Not just what's happening with the Middle East and crude, but also what's happened or hasn't happened over in China. Absolutely. Well, the situation in China has been that for most the first half of this year, most economists were quite disappointed with the growth data. We've had a more bearish outlook on China than most when it comes to our GDP forecast. But what's happened over the summer is that China has done little bits of policy here and there. And it's kind of <clears throat> built up to a much more mixed view on, in the market on China, which is, is China slowing down or is it bouncing back? And the property measures, such as cutting mortgage rates for first-time buyers, is a significant one because most of the Chinese property market is first-time buyers. Well, that's going to lead to some of the Chinese data looking healthier over the short term. But for us, the long term is that China's trade balance, China's current account, those flows are looking pretty uh, weak. Uh, especially with the tourism outflows, which are going to continue to pick up. So from a flow perspective, we're not seeing the inflows into China bonds like we saw from foreign investors either. Altogether, weaker outlook for China, a bit messy in the short term for data surprises because of all of these sort of measures that were announced. But the big picture is a slowdown and a weaker renminbi for us. Does that make it more difficult to make a call for next year that goes beyond 110? 
Well, the difficulty with the euro dollar view is that when the Fed cuts rates, when you get liquidity, it leads to dollar weakness. Now, we have the view that the Fed could even cut rates as soon as March because of a recession call that the U.S. economics team at Nomura have. That starts in Q4, by the way. But if they're wrong, if we get an actual soft landing for the next few months, because soft landings can last a few months before it turns into a hard landing. Um, if we have all the data in the U.S. Uh, pretty healthy in Q4, it pushes those Fed cuts out. So that 110 call is based on that, a Q1 story next year, really, where the market quickly shifts to saying, yep, Fed cuts are coming in the next few meetings. At the moment, we're in the higher for longer phase. That's why the dollar's uh, not selling off here. Jordan, one reason why I love your research is because you always put the sort of conviction level that you have on each trade. Can you talk about how difficult it is to have conviction at a moment where you're dealing with so many variables? We're tracking the weather again. We're tracking, uh, you know, different congestion pricing and congestion uh, emissions over in China to understand the recovery. I mean, how do you have conviction in a market like this? You have to look at the local stories, I think. So you have the broad dollar view, which we've got a pretty high conviction on, you know, three to four out of five, I would say, uh, for the do long dollar view. Then the local story. And what helps me, Lisa, is positioning. So just a few weeks ago, maybe let's go back four weeks ago, you would have had guests on here saying the Bank of England could raise rates maybe to 7%. And because of one week services CPI and one Bank of England meeting and a week labor report as well, it's quickly shifted to the Bank of England's done. And because of that shift in narrative, you've got a lot of stale positioning out there. So I think in sterling, there's still a long sterling position amongst some investors that needs to be unwound. We've gone through a lot of that already, but I think there's more to go. So that helps me have a four out of five on short cable, for example. Or then you have to look at the other factors in Asia and elsewhere and think, where is there less positioning? I think that's where uh, you have lower conviction. So if there's less positioning, less of a positioning squeeze, there's not much of a trade to do. But short cable, short euro, I think there's still some stale longs out there uh, that need to be unwound. Jordan, this is a pretty toxic recipe for the Bank of England and for the uh, European Central Bank, right, with inflation? Well, inflation's coming down. The main thing is, does it not fall to 2%? And that's what the central banks are really worried about. I personally look at all these charts that help us forecast inflation, and it looks like it's going even below 2% on some of them. So PPI, which is the manufacturing inflation in the UK and Europe, it's pretty awful. Uh, I think in Norway, it's minus 35% year on year. So you get these extremes in manufacturing that will push the headline down eventually. So I think, look, we could be looking at CPI falling much closer to 2% than central banks think. And then, Lisa, we'll be looking at global recession risks in the early part of next year. And a lot of these central banks that are worried about inflation today will be very worried about growth and employment tomorrow. We've already got signs in the UK labour data, the Swedish labour data. There's layoffs happening. And when we get to uh, the year end, I think a lot of central banks will be changing their focus on inflation was high today and focusing more on the fact that it's going to be quite low tomorrow. The main risk to that, of course, is oil uh, and the supply side. So in the US, these UAW strikes are boosting car prices. And as we know, the oil market's moving headline inflation higher as well. If we have another rise in oil to 110 per barrel, then inflation will be, uh, the, the central banks will be in a stagflationary mode and the markets won't like it. FX will be selling those sort of currencies like the pound, like the Swedish krona, uh, because that's what the sort of mix we had in 2022. So we could be going back to a 2022 style FX market reaction, which was massive dollar strength. Well, 20 seconds for you, Jordan, you can have it. When was the last time Villa scored six goals? I can't remember, that's a good stat, but it's bloody good, isn't it? It's bloody good, Tom, do you hear that? Jordan Rochester. Jordan's words. Not I, I practice all weekend proper. <laughs> Jordan Rochester in the morning. Jordan, thank you. It was you. proper. It was proper what? It was a proper game. It's a proper game. Yeah, it was a proper game. Tons of goals. You like that? I watched, I do like it. I watched now, Liverpool. if each goal was worth seven points, you'd really like that, well, that's, wouldn't you? Yeah, that's ridiculous. Stop throwing shade <laughs> at US football. Was, Come on. That <laughs> that's was, ridiculous. Wouldn't that make a difference? <laughs> wouldn't that make a difference? <laughs> okay, let's get mm. it. Let's get it out of the Throw way. Some more tackle it and it's go. a new soundtrack. Sure. I could dance to this beat. She's on the, the lights so are much, so bright. <laughs> but they never blame me. Welcome to New York. Welcome to New York. Enough with the shade. Okay. Mohammed from Cambridge emailed says, why haven't you brought up the Jets top of the I'm, show? I'm surprised he wants us to talk about the Jets. Didn't they lose? You know. Taylor made an appearance. Better Life is Mets. good. You know, <laughs> there's a glow. The reason why. I've heard that there's complaints in, about these sort of switch to, you know, the camera switches yeah. to Taylor's reactions all the time. The, the reaction yeah. cam, yeah. That people don't want it. Yeah. yeah. Well, who's, who's people? Like football fans. Right, right. Not it. the switches. <laughs> Precisely. <laughs>
in the U.S., we see inflation cooling, we see the economy slowing. Disinflation, it has been very consistent. The transmission of higher rates really didn't flow through with the normal four to six quarter lag that we were expecting. I think we're seeing the beginnings of an unraveling. We continue to think that the Fed is at a peak. We also continue to think that the Fed is going to be cutting interest rates next year. This is Bloomberg Surveillance with Tom Keen, Jonathan Farrow and Lisa Abramowitz. Let's get your week started live from New York City this morning. Good morning, good morning for our audience worldwide. This is Bloomberg Surveillance on TV and radio alongside Tom Keane and Lisa Rabbits. I'm Jonathan Farrow. Your equity market pop didn't last that long. We are totally unchanged on the S&P 500. Crisis averted, avoided TK, at least for now. Yeah, widely predicted. I think our Washington coverage has been great on this. Some real humility about, you know, don't do this theory, that theory, the other. But... What a shock. Three hours before whatever it was, he did a John Boehner and got the Democrat uh, vote. It's something we've talked about here a lot. We can do it all over again over the next month into November 17. 17th. It's just, you know. Anne-Marie coming up in about 15 minutes. She'll bore you with that. Then Congressman French Hill. Lots to talk about leadership in the House I a little bit up. later. French Hill, 7.45 Eastern Time. I looked at the votes in the Washington Post all laid out. And the first one I went to to see what the gentleman from Arkansas did. I knew what he would do, but sure. I actually went to see what French Hill's vote was. We'll catch up with French a little bit later. 165, the estimate for Friday. Bramo, tons of data this week. Chairman Powell coming up as well. But 165, the estimate against 187 the previous month. So we're actually going to get data. That is the headline, really, that we were going to get the data that we had been previously yes. expecting and that it basically opens the door to a greater potential for a November rate hike. This is from Andrew Hollenhorst, who has been calling for that anyway. But that seems to be what's playing out in markets. The fact that we're going to get data that confirms ongoing strength, albeit at a slower pace, but still solid labor market will allow the Fed to keep going further and keep rates higher for longer. That's why I said good news might be bad news. And I know people are going to be like, oh, my God, we hate this phrase. And I agree with you. But at the same time, that seems to be what's playing out in markets. And then we can move on to earnings. October 13th, JP Morgan, just two Fridays away. That's just around the corner as well. As we kick off Q4 and wave good riddance, not goodbye to Q3, your record market looks like this on the S&P. Equity futures are just about positive by zero. 0.04% after a quarterly loss, a monthly loss, and a fourth week of losses on the S&P. Yields are higher through 3Q by more than 70 basis points. This morning up six. TK, your 10-year, 462.89. Yeah, no, watching the far out the yield curve uh, is, is, well, it's sort of a jumble. Like you said, we were up on the equities, we give it back. But as we talked to Jordan Rochester about, I'm, I'm forced today to look at little itty bitty tea leaves. And what I notice is stronger Swiss franc. You really wonder what that means as a signal for euro weakness. Tally up the weeks, 11 weeks of that. Bramo, can you imagine 12 weeks of euro weakness. We've had 11. Can we make it 12? The euro right now at about 105 against the dollar. Jordan Rochester says yes, because what's going to actually drive it stronger, especially in light of the fact that we're now all watching the weather again to see whether oil prices go up. Here's what I'm watching in terms of the data. At 10 a.m. we get U.S. ISM manufacturing as well as the prices paid for that component. We have been in recession, in a contractionary phase for manufacturing since October of last year. We are inflecting upward. That inflection is interesting to me at a time where People are wondering, where are the nodes of inflation reacceleration? Could it come from the manufacturing sector that has been in recession? At 10 a.m., J.P. Morgan CEO Jamie Dimon is speaking with Bloomberg's very own Emily Chang in London at the J.P. Morgan Tech Stars Forum. It is going to be interesting whether he reiterates either strength. Does he go to 8 percent projection on 10-year yields? Or does he talk about the fact that we end up you know, in a situation where the consumer is slowing down? And today, this is, this is for you, Tom. Fed speak. Let's go through it. It's 11 a.m. I think it's legit. <laughs> it is legit Fed speak. It's 11 a.m. Fed Chair Jay Powell and Philadelphia uh, President, Fed President Patrick Harker both speaking in New York, Pennsylvania. 1.30 p.m. we get uh, New York Fed President John Williams. He will be speaking in New York City. This is not the same speech, I believe, as the one that he was supposed to deliver we'll at Long Island. Be there. <laughs> well, thank you, Tom, for that. And then at 7.30 p.m. Cleveland Fed President Loretta Messer will be speaking. We are at a point where it is very difficult to have any clarity. And John, I have to wonder at what point the Fed speak adds to that at this point, because as you've been mentioning, no one said anything about Jay Powell's discussion last week. And I understand he was talking to a community forum, um, you know, sure. student educators or whatever, but the point being here is that they don't really have much to say. 10, 10, 6, 10, 12. What's that? 10, 13, 
11-1. Those are my four data points of October after the November 1 Fed meeting. That's all that matters. Let me guess, is that payroll, CPI, and JP Morgan? Yes. Okay. It's I'm here to translate. All that matters. <laughs> They're the dates. That's, that's okay. everything else is toxic brew of stew. Yeah, Bram, I'm trying. It's like a crossword puzzle. My heart it is. Time. Been doing this a I'm, long time. Are you good at crossword puzzles? <laughs> Just translate it. It depends. I'm like the worst. It depends. I'm like the absolute worst. My name is Sam Stovall, it. he's good at crossword puzzles. Eh? Chief investment strategist yes. at CFRA joins us now. Sam, explain this one for me. What is a counter trend rally and why are you looking for one? Good morning, Jonathan. Counter trend rally. Well, I think basically there's been too much pessimism in the market in the short term, looking at such factors as the relative strength index, stochastics. I guess taking it from a technical perspective says, you know, we've, we've pushed the balloon too far underwater and now it has to pop at least in the near term. Uh, based on possibly the reversal of yields right now, uh, the continuing um, decline in the uh, employment numbers uh, and rise in the unemployment. Right. So basically right. saying that as we head into Q4, we could end up with a bit of q foria. Sam, well, the q foria is, you know, it's cute. It's, should we steal that? <laughs> Let's make a decision now. Let's take a meeting. Don't steamroll steal over that. that. You've got to sit on that. We've got to sit on yeah. foria We're going to steal on that. Q4ia I'm going to go to Don McLean. Group. Forget about American Pie. Let's do Vincent. You're acclaimed for your stars. How have your stars changed? Four and five star dynamic, Sam, into the fourth quarter. If it's starry, starry fourth quarter, what's it going to be at CFRA? Well, our analysts are out of this world, uh, but I would certainly say that the stars have not changed all that much, which I think is a good indication. When you look to uh, relative strength on a short term and on a longer term basis, we're still showing strength in those growth areas, communication services, consumer discretionary technology, and to a lesser extent, energy. Uh, and so our stars continue to show a greater percentage right. of the uh, coverage uh, gravitating toward those areas. So I think that we are going to see a recovery in the fourth quarter of this year. And those groups that led the way in the first half will continue to shine in this final quarter. I can't say enough, Lisa, that is the S&P CFRA and frankly, Bloomberg Intelligence way. But damn the short-term BS, look at the long-term, and those stars show stability of revenue down the income statement to earnings of all the different sectors. Gloria Cavacino said that it's very hard to see the stars right now because we are such a muddied, uh, we're in such a muddied position when it comes to the economic cycle, Sam. How predicated is Qforia on rates going lower? Well, I think that's just part of the overall equation. Um, I mean, historically, if you go back to World War II, Every pre-election fourth quarter of third term presidents have seen a positive total return with the average gain being around 6%. We've seen those sectors that have been the outperformers being in the technology, materials, and industrial space, whereas uh, utilities, real estate have been among the underperformers. So I think that uh, investors basically are going to start to look toward the end of 2024. They're going to give up on looking to the end of 23, and anything that far out in the future, myself included, looks an awful lot better. Just to put a bow on this, are you saying that basically we've seen the lows in tech prices? Um, I think that we have seen a near-term low in tech prices. I wouldn't necessarily say that uh, the shakeout has totally run its course. I'm still looking for a, uh, a test of the 4,200 level on the S&P 500. That would bring it down to about 8.5% uh, pullback since the July 31 uh, high. And NASDAQ probably could end up uh, being a double-digit decline before all is said and done. But I think that would represent a better buying opportunity as we move into 2024. Sam, I'm focused on the banks. Give me your treatment of a Q4 recovery in the banks. The technical chart is ugly. Well, the banks, sure, when you're uh, looking at the, uh, mainly the regional banks uh, continue to look pretty bad. Also, you find that the uh, diversified banks are having their challenges. But if you look to financials, uh, this uh, second quarter, I mean, third quarter, the financials are expected to narrow their loss from a 6% decline in earnings last quarter to a 
0.3% shortfall this quarter. And if you realize that 54 of the last 56 quarters have seen actual results exceed end of quarter estimates, I would tend to say we might end up chalking up one more in this third quarter and actually go from an earnings recession back into an earnings expansion. Sam, do banks need higher yields or lower yields? Well, the, the higher yields give them a greater net interest income, uh, but I think also it uh, ends up causing them to be more restrictive on their lending policy. So uh, I, I really would rather that they end up having more of a, uh, a flat to softening in, in, um, interest rate environment, because then also you would see less of a increasing threat of recession and a greater likelihood of a soft landing. Hasn't benefited those stocks this year at all. Sam, thank you, sir. Sam Stovall there of CFRA navigating the stars under cloudy skies. That was Chairman Powell, wasn't it? Jackson yeah. Hole. Speaking of Jackson Hole, Patrick Harker caught up with Patrick Harker of the Philadelphia Fed. I always think audience matters. Lisa talked about Chairman Powell sitting down with Patrick Harker to participate in a roundtable discussion with workers, small business owners, and community leaders. Now, Patrick Harker talked about anecdotal evidence of a slowdown. I wonder if they receive that anecdotal evidence today. I would guess that they will, because what you can see is in the data, you have seen small business bankruptcies tick up pretty dramatically. Uh, a significant portion, basically three fourths of all small business owners are saying that their business is being hampered, is being hurt by rates where they are. So that's the view that they're gonna be hearing. The fact that they're leaning into that, does that give you a sense of a sort of more dovish inclination of a Fed. Are those businesses going to say you've done enough and start banging the table, TK? They're going to bang the table and they're going to think it's going to be about capitalism. You know, back when I had my first pair of Boston Birkenstocks, you know, and, <laughs> and I see you in Birkenstocks. I'm, I'm in really the record cannot. store in Amherst, Mass, and it's like a complete lineup of, of bootleg Grateful Dead records. Doug Cass has them all. And you're looking there, and did I ever think Birkenstock would pop out with an LVMH private equity? Can you see me wearing my Birkenstock Bostons into Tiffany's? Do you still have I mean, some Birkenstocks? I have three or four pair, yes. I have the Do old you? pair. I don't wear them. They're up top. With I socks or without socks? With, well, now with socks. Darda, wear with Darda socks. wears them with okay. socks. If Darda <laughs> wears them with socks, I'm wearing my Birkenstocks with socks. We're putting the IPO price up on the screen. For those of you listening on radio, it's the IPO price. This is american $44 to $49. we have got this chat with our producer who are screaming, someone say the news, which seems to be, <laughs> seems to sum up this program pretty well. The news, it? but damn. Why are we talking about Birkenstocks? This, we're talking, no, <laughs> this is our no. <laughs> Seriously, <laughs> John, we're sure. talking about them because it's been a private German company since the time of George Washington, picked up by our no, private equity, private, you know, Catterton or something, yeah. LVMH deal, and they're Louis Vuittoning Birkenstocks. That's un-American. People at home just screaming, someone say the news. <laughs> If you're just tuning in, welcome. I hope you're still with us. Equity futures totally unchanged. We're negative now by just 0.01%. Coming up a little bit later in the next hour, David Leibovitz of JP Morgan Asset Management. Lots to look forward to this week. Pushing ahead to payrolls on Friday. Tons of Fed speed through today and through the week as well. The ISM on manufacturing and ADP report, jobless claims on Thursday. Lisa, a lot to get your hands around, and I'm with you. If we had a shutdown, there was a real risk the potential that we wouldn't get the payrolls report on Friday, then all the emphasis would get put on earnings. It's pretty good to get that news a little bit later. It is pretty good when it comes to clarity, maybe. But is it going to necessarily create this feeling that the Fed's going to hike rates in November? Because if things come in pretty well, then the Fed can't sort of shift the sort of more dovish uh, feel that they might be getting from some of these small business owners. Do you like the wool felt? Birkenstocks, or do you like the leather ones? I like the leather ones. The leather ones? Yeah, the leather ones are more it's brand humble. Just yeah. against sandals. I, just I, totally I against have sandals. The, well, then, well, the Bostons <laughs> aren't the sandals, beach? though. It's sure, that's fine. Okay. Yeah, that's fine. But in New York City, uh, absolutely oh, not. Come on, John, I absolutely can see not. you. Wolf Felt Bostons, absolutely you look great. Absolutely no chance. They're not, they have a, a, you can hide no your ugly clothes. What about like nice sandals? No, in the city. Absolutely not. Why not? No. What no. if it's hot? It gets hot. It gets sticky. What do you do? Was that a road you show? Wear, you wear sandals with socks, apparently. What's that Can about? Can you imagine <laughs> the merch at the Birkenstock Road Show? All eyes turn to the U.S. job market. The jobs report, it beckons. It looks like companies are just holding on, holding on, holding on to workers. What you see is what you get. We're seeing a lot of strength. This Friday, Tom, Jonathan, Lisa, and Mike will bring you crucial data and expert analysis at terminal speed. This is exactly what the Fed is looking for. They now believe you can get back to 2%. 
without damaging the labor market at all. We might get a bigger whammy than we expect. The September Jobs Report, Friday on Bloomberg Television and Radio. I do intend to file a motion to vacate against Speaker McCarthy this week. I think we need to this rip week. off the Band-Aid. I think we need to move on with new leadership that can be trustworthy. I'll survive. You know, this is personal with Matt. Matt voted against the most conservative ability to um, protect our border, secure our border. He's more interested in securing TV interviews than doing something. It feels personal. Congressman Matt Gates there, yeah. House Speaker Kevin McCarthy on the Sunday shows. Mr. Gates, Congressman Gates catching up with Bloomberg's Anne Marie Joe Matthew later on on Balance of Power, 5 p.m. Eastern Time. Do not miss that conversation. If you are just joining us, welcome to the program. Your equity market on the S&P 500 almost totally unchanged this morning. No pop post that government shutdown averted news over the weekend. Equities positive here by just 0.02 percent. Yields are higher, though, by let's call it five basis points on a 10 year TK. 462.48. Watching the data here, and again, John, in the ISM, when, when is it, Lisa? 10 o'clock this morning, mm -hmm. 10 a.m. We're going to get this important John Farrow uh, a, a data. I agree it's important, but all of a sudden we get data dependency wrapped around, what, 18 Fed speakers today. It's an eventful Monday. Everyone's writing in, Tom, my favorite TK shoes, the leopard print Doc Martens, <laughs> which exists, Warm by the way. yesterday, actually. <laughs> really <laughs> comfortable. They exist. The no, shoes. why do I wear them? Why, why do, do the truth? Please, please share. <laughs> instead why do you of, wear them? Instead of having to wear old fart, you know, shoes that look ugly as sin, Doc Martin makes some very nice shoes where, you know, when I have the walker or don't, yeah, yeah. the dogs, okay. you know, I, I, I could stay stable. It's that or the Prada sneakers. Yeah, well, the okay. Prado, that's, that's, the that's different. That's like for, you know, the work and all that. But the Doc Martens work, but the Birkenstocks don't work. You know, I, I just, you know, I, I, I used to wear them a lot. And, you know, the wool ones. I still can't picture that. How do you get stability in something John, like that? John, Where do you find stability? John, clogs. <laughs> <laughs> I wore clogs. The wooden yeah, clogs. I wore those. Yeah, yeah, in high school. In, in, like in a serious way. <laughs> Yes. <laughs> yeah. yes. Not ironically. Though. Let's move on. <laughs> right now we're going to get saved by Amory Horton. We're going to do what? serious stuff. We're going to do the serious stuff first. We'll get to, back to AMH, our IPO reporter here in a moment. She's our Bloomberg I Worked All Weekend correspondent. A, a really important moment for Balance of Power tonight, Amory Horton, your conversation with a gentleman from Florida. What is the relationship of Mr. Gates with the leader of his crew, Mr. Trump. I'm fascinated by Trump DeSantis and different Trump Gates. Well, he's uh, Matt Gates, the congressman from Florida, is self-described as the, quote, Trumpiest congressman. So I think that tells you a lot about where his allegiance lies and also how he likes to um, really, uh, you know, fashion himself on Capitol Hill. He wants to be... Um, extreme. He definitely does like a lot of attention. As Speaker McCarthy said in that interview, he's about securing television interviews. He wants to get his message out. And that message is this week is that he is going to file that motion to vacate. Um, the big question for him is, does he ha does Matt Gates have the votes? Does he have the Republican, some Republican support he will need on top of the Democrats who would, you would think, vote to oust Speaker McCarthy, but that's a little bit unsure at the moment. Uh, that's the big question for him. Well, he secured another interview, hasn't he, Anne-Marie, a little bit later, 5 p.m. <laughs> Eastern time. What's the focus of that conversation going to be for you? I think it has to be if he has the votes, Jonathan, but also really what's his aim here? Because he did vote against uh, one of the conser most conservative stopgap funding measures, uh, a, a resolution that would have cut the federal spending at 30 percent. And now what you see is a, a stopgap resolution. The government's still open till November 17th, but at the same spending levels. So he could have had a more conservative agenda had he vote for that. And he did it. And at the same time, he did vote for continuing resolutions under the Trump administration. So why is this an issue for him now? Economics, the efficient allocation of resources, time. And Marie, typically, if there's a story that I don't <clears throat> feel like I need to pay attention to, I won't pay attention to it. Will the outcome of November 17th be any different to the outcome over the weekend? Is this a story I can ignore between now and then? Well, it depends how much work gets done, right? They still have to finish these 12 appropriation bills. Uh, the House is a more far, is for further along than the Senate. 
But then they also have to come to conference because the Senate bills that it's run by Democrats is going to look very different than the conservative bills, which is run by uh, Republicans in the House. And can that get done before November 17th at the same time? How much more difficult is that situation going to be to get done? Twelve appropriation bills at the same time. Potentially, we might have a sp- another speaker vote. Remember the last speaker vote in January? That was 15 rounds. Now, not saying that this is going to go anywhere with Congressman Gates. Uh, you know, there is a potential path for Speaker McCarthy to maintain his position. But this is going to cause a lot of chaos, and it's going to be a huge distraction. Well, does the path for McCarthy uh, to be sort of confirmed as speaker and to beat the vote that Matt Gates is bringing to, to the floor, is that path include making concessions to Democrats? Possibly. I mean, what you've heard from so far, whether it's Catherine Clark, she was saying how the whole conference, the Democratic conference needs to discuss what their path forward is. Potentially, no one will actually have to vote for Speaker McCarthy, but they could either not show up or vote present so that he would have enough of the Republicans that do want him to maintain that position, which is the majority uh, that can keep him in that job. But then you're looking at almost, um, you know, a, a dual run conference, because if he's going to need the Democrats support, he's likely going to have to give something up for that. Is Matt Gates gaining in popularity as he does this? I think his name ID, his name recognition is certainly going up. This is someone who really only went on conservative media. Look, he was on ABC this week. He was on CNN. He's coming on Bloomberg this evening. And there's a lot of reporting that he's actually eyeing to run for governor in Florida. He denies that and said he's focused on getting former President Donald Trump elected. But if he's looking to run for governor of Florida, he is certainly getting his name ID up, uh, not just in Florida, but also nationally. And also joining us this morning, our IPO correspondent. And he's campaigning on it. Yeah, okay. Well, joining us now, our IPO correspondent. Uh, Anne-Marie oh, Harder and Anne-Marie, you know, I got to ask you about, I know you and I were talking last time we saw each other about the Dior Birkenstocks. They're $120. Dior does a collab. They do a Savoir Fair collab and pop these puppies out with Birkenstock to $1,100. <laughs> they scream AMH. Would you be caught dead in those, Anne-Marie Harder, the Tokyo Mule Dior by Birkenstock collab? No, just because I was looking at the photo there, just because it's Dior or Miu Miu or Manolo Blahnik, I'm a hard no on Birkenstocks. So there we oh, go. No, I mean, there you go. You know, but John, you've led on this seriously. Oh, luxury, I've been leading our coverage worldwide. Yeah. Lu- well, come on, <laughs> luxury has cratered, <laughs> right? In Q3, luxury cratered, I didn't right? Even bring this up. There was some weakness I'm based also on a what hard we heard no from a couple Crocs. of companies, likes of Richemont. Yeah. We're talking about North American weakness. Yeah. yeah, there was a hope that reopening some of the travel from China would bring the tourists back to a, the United States and boost North American luxury spend, but I'm not sure I, it's happening in quite the same way. I got, forget about the jokes about Birkenstock. The fact is, here's a private family company back to George Washington that LVMH is capitalizing. I mean, there, this is, a, I, mean, I don't know, is, is the price that they announced this morning a big deal? I don't know. But it's just amazing. I didn't go to the road show like you did. And, and I just, I'm fascinated by what the is doing What's there. What's going on? Are we? <laughs> Let's it's a go serious buy conversation we yeah. can have away from Birkenstock. I do think this issue around the budget deficit in the Treasury market is absolutely massive. I, I really do. And I think there's, there's this intellectual standpoint whereby you just stick with the old sort of school of thought, which is it doesn't matter, it's never mattered. The fact they're not taking it seriously in Washington. Yeah. They're really well, not taking this seriously at all in D.C. And, yeah, and Lisa, this is critical to our conversation last week with Maya McGinnis. Well, we're dealing with a situation where we did not term out our debt the way that a lot of consumers did. The United States has to refinance at the current rates, and that means interest payments go through the roof at a time where the total deficit I, I is also admit, going through the roof. I have to admit I'm watching interest payments of the government. Peter Orzag taught me that years ago when he was head of Congressional Budget The Office. reason consumer balance sheets are strong is because the sovereign balance sheet isn't. That's the story of the last three years. AMH, thank you. Looking forward to the Jim. conversation a little bit later. 5 p.m. Eastern Time, special edition of Balance of Power, live from Capitol Hill with Bloomberg's Anne-Marie and Joe Matthew. Live from New York, this is Bloomberg.
conversation and commercial break totally out of control. We've got to do Big Ramo. Lou. <laughs> I've said it. <laughs> oh, I could go. Ramo Cam. Yeah, well. We've yeah. got to take that life. You also do. had some Absolutely. revealing moments. That's all I could say. Sure, okay. Not as revealing. <laughs> Equities on the S&P. Unchanged. Let's call it positive, not even a tenth of 1%, up by 0.06%. On the NASDAQ, up by 0.25%. On the S&P <clears> last month, down on the month last week, down on the week last quarter, down on the quarter. Biggest quarterly loss of the year so far on the S&P 500. The blame game, many things to blame. Pick out a bond market, two-year, 10-year, 30-year. Let's slice and dice the yield curve. Two-year, yield higher by six basis points, 5.1%. 10-year, 462.89. Last quarter on the 10-year, up 73 basis points, up more than 40 basis points in September alone. Just a monster move in a 10-year yield on a 30-year Getting comfortable with the idea that the 30 year is trading in the 470s. 474 yields up by four basis points. So, this curious moment, we avert, avoid a shutdown. Equities pop for about five minutes, they fade. Yields are up, and that sticks. Sticks again right now, up by five on a 10 year. The story in the FX market, euro dollar, 11 weeks of euro weakness and dollar strength. Can we make it? Week 12, euro, 105.35, negative 0.3%. Yen weakness out there as well. Dollar yen, 149.73, getting closer and closer, closer to and 150, up by 0.2%. Two opposing forces right now. JGBs have been selling off. Yields have been higher. We conclude the BOJ is comfortable with a high yield. How much higher and how quickly that can move higher, we don't know. BOJ stepped in once. It's going to step in twice. Bramo, just to cap the speed, maybe not put a line in the sand as to what level they like. But ultimately, as they do that, yen weakness coming around the corner all over again. And this is why we're closer to 150 this morning. They're going to be buying uh, five to 10 year JGBs starting on Wednesday. What this does, if they reduce yields, then they lessen demand for the currency. And that's what you see. So they're this push pull kind of place. And which gives first? And you raise the question, which do they care about most? What's the rate of change that they care about most at a time? where it's unclear what their ultimate destination is. Clear that they're uncomfortable with the pace of that move in the Japanese government bond market. We'll keep one eye on that. Under surveillance this morning, the US government avoiding a shutdown after approving a stopgap measure that will keep it funded until November 17th. However, the last minute deal does not include $6 billion in support for Ukraine. President Biden and leadership in the US Senate urging Speaker McCarthy to resume aid. McCarthy is looking to tie support, though, for Ukraine to immigration and border security. Tom. This, I think, just sets the parameters for a fight for the next month in Washington. Well, the fight for the next month in Washington, but what's fascinating about this, and I don't mean to be like Bram or Gloom about it, but I feel like I'm watching 1938, where FDR is doing Lend-Lease in Europe, trying to get funding of America for something we don't want to look at in Europe. Why is this any different? We don't want to do Ukraine. So we're, there's this growing emotion of saying, why are we funding Ukraine? And, you know, I thought some of the comments by the leaders this weekend were really, really quite clear. We're doing this because they're fighting our war. There's some serious comments this weekend. There's also a concern about the signal to European allies, especially because there's some yeah. splintering going on. There was that Slovakian uh, leader that was just uh, elected on the basis of not supporting Ukraine. So at what point does this give ammunition to some of that voice over in Europe at a time where we are heading into a really tough winter? You'd have to get the, uh, I think you can draw the conclusion, Lisa, that the support for the Ukraine war effort on the Republican side was already fading. But the issues at the southern border have become so much more prominent. But even now, you're seeing Democrats, I think Kathy Hochul, New York yes, governor. Yes, I said this this weekend. Coming out and just starting to lean towards, Tom, the conservative point of view. And, Bramo, that's a change. That's a change. And tying the two issues, conflating them the way Speaker McCarthy is going to over the next month, it's going to make things really tense and really difficult going into a big election year. Here's my question. Is Kevin McCarthy going to cater to the centrists or to the right part of his party that he already has kind of well, moved He decided away from? that this weekend with the is, vengeance. Did he? But is he going to follow through on that? Because if that's the case, is there some sort of consensus in the center on both of those issues? I think so. I think on board, I think you're dead on. I mentioned it twice this weekend. There's this growing bipartisan shock over migration that was not there one year ago, four years ago, six years ago. It's there front and center now, that's for sure, particularly over the weekend. A couple more stories to get through. U.S. auto workers, the strike marking its third week. The latest sticking point 
being benefits for workers at electric vehicle battery plants. The UAW president, Sean Fain, expanded the strike against Ford and General Motors while sparing Stellantis on Friday. The union is still calling for a 30% pay hike, down from the initial 40% at these standard negotiations. And your last story here, one we've been following, Apple saying software updates are coming to the iPhone 15 after reports of overheating. The company admits the devices can get hot during the first few days of setting up or restoring the phones due to increased background activity. Apple denies that any heat issues, Lisa, are related to the new A17 processor or for that matter, you can't blame the titanium yeah, case yeah. either. We heard this from Dan Ives, right? He was like, it's a software glitch. It's like the bait yeah. of what Dan I mean, seriously, it's last al week. It's almost like he... It's has like plugged like, yeah, into, yeah, 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 like yeah, the sure. tentacles in there because they're like, oh, we know he's going to go out there and say what we need him to say. Look, I don't know. I mean, if they solve it, why didn't they solve it ahead of time, especially if they knew this was going to be a problem, number one. And number two, this just raises a question about, you know, is this just another manufactured glitch that they can be like, look, we overcame it and look, we outperformed. Great. Buy an iPhone, Tom. They're going to overcome this issue. Seems to be the message from Apple. It's yeah. not the processor. It's not the titanium Instagram. case. What else do you do? Like, they literally blamed, like, Uber and Instagram. What did Mark Gurman talk about over the weekend? He wrote a couple of he, was, he, was he was talking fire. about was maybe them fire. developing their own search engine. Yeah, th yeah, this was a bombshell from Mark Gurman, and I'll be honest, I haven't read it completely or talked to Mark, but, you know, there it is. Apple's going to try to compete with Google on search. That's what Gurman does. Amazing. Joining us now, Sonia Meskin, head of U.S. Macro at BNY Mellon, with a really interesting short note. She comes with experience from the New York Federal Reserve System and also her work at London School of Economics in Pennsylvania. I love your note on the ambiguity of higher for longer. Discuss the what-ifs here of this Q3, Q4 debate over higher for longer. Sure. Well, uh, the thing to keep in mind here, and I think the market is actually proving that right now, of course, there is the news of the BOJ. Uh, but structurally, we believe that the natural rate or the rate that balances savings and investment in the U.S. economy has risen compared to the previous cycle. And what that means is that, A, the Fed is going to have to keep rates higher for longer, but it also means that they're possibly not as restrictive as we would have believed them to be in the previous cycle if they'd raised rates this far. Uh, uh, will the Fed be overcome by events? To me, that's a key thing. You're, you're an acclaimed Fed watcher with your service at New York Fed. Is this a Fed that just has to wait for the data, wait for the dialogue, the narrative, and then act? Well, it's very difficult to estimate the natural rate in real time, just like it is difficult to estimate the uh, term premium in real time. They're both actually unobservable in real time, which I think is a big reason why the Fed is saying we're just going to wait for the data and see how that shakes out. Does the It'll data, help with our observations. Does the data scream right now that we're sufficiently restrictive from your standpoint? Well, you know, it's hard to say. I, I think that, in fact, uh, the strength of the consumer, the strength of the housing market, and even the resilience of manufacturing, given the run-up in rates that we've had, uh, tells us that the economy is quite a bit stronger fundamentally than it was in the previous cycle. How are you gauging that in real time? Are you following companies, a select group of corporations? Are you following economic data? What are you looking at to judge that? You've got that? to do both. You really have to look at it from top down and bottom up and compare the two. Right now, when you look at what the Fed is doing and the fact that we're going to have a meeting today with Patrick Harker and uh, Vetcher J. Powell with a group of small business owners who are feeling the pain more substantially, do you think that the Fed has their finger on the pulse, is biased to the right place of possibly not being restrictive enough versus concern about being overly restrictive? Well, I do think that uh, lower tiers of the consumer um, are feeling this more um, than uh, folks that have, you know, high net worth built up. Similarly, companies that that are in the somewhat weaker position in terms of, you know, debt issuance are probably feeling it more than those that are well positioned in terms of their cash balances. So yes, we are in a somewhat bifurcated economy at this point, but I think on net, we're still in a much stronger place than we would have expected to be last year. How closely are you watching the dynamic uh, that John and Tom were talking about earlier, that the interest payments are going up so significantly for the United States? that the deficit is expanding and there is increasing concern about the ability to pay this back. This leads to either fiscal withdrawal 
uh, or it leads to something else, which is higher yields and bond vigilantes. Is How are you gaming this scenario out? Well, I think that's a very, very tough one. I think that's actually a bigger concern at this point than even potentially near-term consumer or corporate weakness, right? Uh, because uh, if rates rise on a, a sort of sustainable basis, then it will be eventually more difficult for the U.S. government to refinance itself and or finance itself, right? It'll be more expensive to the taxpayer. And at the same time, corporate uh, corporates would have to refinance into a higher rate environment as well. So it will get, we will get squeezed potentially from the public and private side. But are you suggesting that fiscal policy and fiscal economics will intrude on the monetary policy debate? Technically, they shouldn't. The Fed should be independent. It takes uh, the U.S. fiscal side as a given. Um, but, you know, it's a tough situation for them. And uh, in the past cycle, at least inflation was well contained. This time around, if inflation reaccelerates, um, say because we have structural tightness in the U.S. labor market, um, it'll be a very tough situation for them. Hear this from Andrew Honnenhorst over at City. House prices, energy the tightness of the labor market. Where does that risk for re-accelerating inflation come from for you out of those things? You know, I, I think this uh, NFP report coming out will be very interesting to watch, not just the headline gains, but also um, what's happening with the participation rate. Uh, because, for example, we've had a lot of the gains in the participation rate from foreign-born workers that might peter out um, and will be back to more of a structural tightness in the labor market. This rate is a major question for a lot of people. Of the inflation decline that we have seen, the disinflation that we've witnessed so far through this year, how much of that has been a result of the Fed's tightening? And how much of it has just been the supply side responding to what we've seen at the price level? Uh, we would say the supply side has been a big part of the story. Um, certainly, there's been some weakness overall in the economy from the Fed tightening. But again, as we discussed, much less than we would have expected it's last year. It's hard to point to a significant amount of demand destruction off the back of the Fed's tightening. Yes. So how on earth do they know if they're sufficiently restrictive? What on earth is this conversation about? Well, there's long and variable lags as always, and those are <laughs> variable, I think. You know, okay. the Fed is leaning into variable and long. <laughs> or maybe short. That's straight out of the cheat sheet at the FOMC, isn't it? Yep, pretty much. Bramo, isn't that a confusing point for you so too? So memorized it. I'm, I'm struggling with understanding the bond market entirely right now, because how much is this really being driven by those deficits, by the fiscal backdrop, how much do we understand the resilience in the economy? We don't. I mean, honestly, how many times have economists gotten it wrong this year? It's Every week is another thing that people seem to miss, myself included. I agree. You're certainly not alone. Sonia, thank you. It's good to see you. Sonia Miskin there of BMY Mellon. If you are just joining us, welcome to the program. The S&P 500 shaping up as follows this Monday morning. We're negative just 0.01%. Yields are a little bit higher by five or six basis points, 462.68. We'll catch up with Michael Pugliese, the senior economist at Wells Fargo at 8.30 Eastern. We'll talk to him, Tom, in about 45 minutes. It'll be interesting to see with the data coming out today and the adjustments. I mentioned those four key dates to get out to November 1, deep into fourth quarter. I, can I just say September just sort of happened? Like I, I don't know if I was there to, part, to participate. Sure. Uh, it was like there was August and the then the there Mark was, was like... We were live. It rained for we all experienced it rained for 14 days, and then the weather was brutal. Friday into Saturday, yeah, and then finally it's October one, and it's like okay, going swimming in Brooklyn on Friday. <laughs> Did you see that? The pictures out of Brooklyn. Really, some Ooh. of our staff was in, were deep in that. Uh, David Gura with us for years was Subway. directly involved. I yeah. had to try to take one home, and did you? I ended up How did that work out? It's like an hour and like a half. Like the waterfall coming yeah. down? Oh, yeah, 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 big time. And just basically delayed. Yeah. Don't you find that people tend to be kind of down, too? So it kind of matches the market's move. Oh, yeah. When it's, when it's kind of what, like, skipping around in the rain. Yeah. Well, I mean, when it's sunny out, people have this sort of pop in their step. You could feel it in the city yesterday. Yeah, 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 but like, yeah. otherwise, people are just kind of down. Let's lift their spirits, Bramo. <laughs> Let's Tell us what you think about this economy. <laughs> Make it better. No, really? it's not happening, well, is it? I mean, it's shown resilience. The fact that you're seeing auto sales Good. pick up. Dig deep. Nice. Congressman French Hill, Republican from Arkansas, is going to be joining us in about five minutes' time. Weighing in on the shutdown discussion over the weekend, just about avoiding one. The next deadline, November 17th. Can we avoid a mess then as well? A spat within the party between Congressman Matt Gates and Speaker McCarthy. We'll hear much more on that a little bit later on. Banners of Power, 5 p.m. Eastern Time. Congressman Gates with Anne-Marie and Joe Matthew from New York. This is Bloomberg.
Are we going to be staring down another shutdown? No well, it all comes to the Senate. The Senate hasn't done one thing. But in the House, are we going to be facing another shutdown November 17th? No, because the House is doing their work. We've already done more than 70 percent of it. So compare this to the Senate. The Senate hasn't passed one bill. The Senate didn't pass anything about the shutdown. House Speaker Kevin McCarthy speaking on CBS, the next line of the sand, November 17th. Live from New York City, welcome to the program. Slightly negative on the S&P 500 to kick off a new trading week, a new month, a new quarter. Welcome to Q4. Equity futures down about a tenth of 1%. Yields are higher by five basis points. Ten-year, 462.48. The euro against the dollar. A weaker euro again. It's week 12. 105.34 on the euro against the dollar. And crude with a lift still in the 90s. Tom, 91.24. WTI up 0.5%. It's a pretty rich data. I mean, it's not like the panic, the sweat of, say, Monday, Tuesday last week, and I can't remember before uh, that. But looking at equities, bonds, currencies, commodities, you got to find a signal here maybe for Q4. And I'm, I sound like a broken record, but to me it's Swiss franc has been resilient and weaker, and that's changed in the last 24 hours. The only thing that's changed is the date. The story's the same. Yields are up, dollar's stronger, equities are struggling. And the dollar strength is happening, Tom, simultaneously at the same time as seeing a rally in crude. It's been difficult, yeah. and that's really difficult for the Europeans. We can go back to that story a little bit later this week. The, the oil debate's going to be fascinating. I mean, I, I don't know really. I mean, Yousef's in, in, in Abu Dhabi with Daniel Jurgen here in the last three hours for Bloomberg, and Jurgen just doesn't buy it. He says demand's not going to be there. Sounds like Ed Morse. That's an Yousef outlier. Yousef bought up the Ed right Morse piece over at City yeah. to get back to the 70s by next year. Yeah. yeah. Demand's going to soften, and you get that supply side response. <clears throat> Let us dive in right now to what you and I witnessed this weekend. He witnessed it as well. The congressman from Arkansas, French Hill, he's been such a good uh, friend of the show and trying to give us perspective on the history we're witnessing. French Hill, I really take issue with people that say this has never happened before. It's an outrage. Baloney, my reading of history back to Alien Sedition Act is this is frequent. Like Joe Cannon... 1910 is an absolute parallel here. From those analogs of the past, alien sedition, Joe Cannon, 1910, what is the outcome for the Speaker of the House you support? Well, Tom, it's great to be with you. Always good to be on the program. Look, I think Kevin McCarthy uh, should uh, Congressman Matt Gates bring a motion to vacate the chair to the House floor. There'll be a motion made to table that motion. And I think Kevin McCarthy survives. Look, Kevin McCarthy has over 200 solid supporters in the Republican Party. You witnessed that in, in January when it took 15 rounds for him to be elected Speaker of the House. And on your historic point, that hadn't happened that many times since 1923, exactly 100 years before. And I think it was nine rounds uh, then. So these items have historic precedent, as you point out. Kevin McCarthy has the support of his conference. He's doing a good job uh, as Speaker of the House, bringing to the House floor important measures. He negotiated single-handedly, virtually, a good debt ceiling deal that lowers spending 2024 over 2023 and has some other important economic reforms. And so that's why I think his colleagues will sustain him uh, as Speaker of the House. You're entrenched in Arkansas. Fine. There are Republicans up north who are not entrenched. And their outrage this weekend seemed to be tangible. Are those Republicans in the North at risk because of the foolishness of the weekend? It's such an important point. We have our majority, Tom, our very narrow majority, where we can only lose uh, four or five votes on the House floor uh, because we have won districts in which President Biden won. So in New York and in California particularly, we have House Republicans that won successfully with outstanding campaigns in 2022, but they might be in a Biden district plus three or a Biden district plus 13. And so they are really hurt in their districts if it looks like we're not governing and not honoring our commitments on spending and regulatory policy. In other words, they're conservatives and they're advocating at home for solid conservative Republican values, but they want to deliver it in a way that makes sense. And this kind of uh, back and forth does, I think, put them at risk. Congressman, does it help them if you combine the Ukraine aid effort with the aid effort for the southern border? Jonathan, I think you'll find that we will uh, move a Ukraine bill in the coming days and that we're building a consensus around what that should look like, including 
oversight of the administration's strategy in Ukraine to win and win promptly. But look, overwhelmingly, and you've seen it in vote after vote, there's a majority of uh, members of Congress that support uh, Ukraine funding. They want to make sure that other countries are doing their part. They want to make sure that that money is transparent, and they want to make sure that uh, the Biden administration is encouraging a strategy in Ukraine that can win and win promptly. There's definitely fatigue after the stalemate of this summer along the front lines of Ukraine. Why is it important to combine that with the border security issue, which essentially is what Speaker McCarthy communicated over the weekend? Well, this is an important political point domestically, Jonathan. People are stunned by the incompetence of the Biden administration to secure the border. Over six million people have crossed the border. Over 151 people on the terror watch list have crossed the border. Uh, hundreds of pounds of fentanyl that can kill the Americans many times over. And 200,000 people a month are coming across the border, setting a record up 25 percent from last year. So I believe, and I hear this from my constituents, the governor of New York has even called out the National Guard on this issue. So every state's a border state. We think the most pressing domestic problem, besides getting spending under control from the pandemic, is the border and border security. And that's why I think Speaker McCarthy set that out. Let's find a compromise and do something about border security, honor a commitment. We've passed that bill across the House floor only with Republican votes. We call it H.R. 2. And we'd like to see if we can get Democrats in support in the Senate for border security. Uh, there's a, there is a strong majority to support Ukraine under the terms that I just outlined. So let's do both. Let's have two, uh, two wins by, uh, by working together. Whether it's the border, whether it's Ukraine, whether it's the budget, whether it's getting Kevin McCarthy to remain a speaker, Congressman, are you finding uh, sort of a, a greater ally in centrist Democrats right now than the far right of the Republican Party? Well, inside the Republican Party, we have some goals. We want to secure the border. We want spending below the pre-pandemic levels to the best that we can, considering the wins that we locked in in the uh, debt ceiling deal between President Biden and Speaker McCarthy. Those are shared priorities inside the Republican conference. We're still educating, in my view, uh, our members on what is the best course forward for Ukraine. I admit there's a party split there, and I'm disappointed about it. I'm a strong supporter of kicking Putin out of Russia. It's an outrage that he's there. And there are many reasons why Putin was green-lighted to invade uh, uh, Ukraine that date back to the Obama administration. Yeah. But well, where we are is where we are, and we're doing that work, I think, to find consensus on how to move forward on Ukraine. Congressman, I guess that what I'm trying to say is if Speaker McCarthy remains speaker, there are going to be some Democrats that basically give a pass to it. Is there increasingly a centrist coalition that's going to have a greater influence going forward? I think it could be. Uh, Lisa, you saw that in the run up on trying to find a solution uh, in this most recent conflict on uh, on the end of year spending, where you had centrist Democrats work with uh, Republicans to try to find a way forward for a continuing resolution. So you may see that continue. And if so, that may be in the best interest of the American people. If centrist Democrats come to the Republican side and work with us on things to cut spending, secure the border, and uh, properly fund uh, assistance to Ukraine. Hey, Congressman, I've known you long enough to know that these issues frustrate you. Shut down debates, debt ceiling issues. Do you think your colleagues in Washington understand that they're losing the privilege to act recklessly based on what's developing in the Treasury market? Jonathan, you are so right. I have made that point repeatedly over the last month. Looking at that 10-year this morning at over 4.6 uh, gets my attention. Moody's comments get my attention. And one thing that we had, and you'll all appreciate this, in the Republican uh, continuing resolution that failed on Saturday, all the Democrats voted against it, and uh, 31 Republicans voted against it. Very disappointing. Very disappointing. It would have secured the border, cut spending by 8% for four weeks was a debt commission, Jonathan. And that's exactly what we need is a bipartisan Alan Greenspan type approach dating back to 1983, where we uh, solved uh, Social Security solvency at the time and produced a 40 year positive outcome for that very, very important program for our seniors. Uh, that's the kind of approach we need to take on finding a bipartisan solution to long term fiscal fiscal concern 
on that two thirds of spending that yeah. the U.S. Congress does not debate. We got to talk more about it. We can do it. Maybe in Alabama, Razorbacks, Bama, October 14th. Congressman, thank you. Congressman French Hill of Arkansas. Live from New York City, this is Bloomberg. Earnings are going to continue to grow next year. We have seen a lot of sectors, a lot of companies already move through an earnings recession. We are seeing some signs of consumer confidence just starting to return a little bit. That consumer and that labor market is something that we are very focused on. If we're not slowing enough, if we're not in a scenario that looks like a recession, well, then you just get some inflation coming right back. This is Bloomberg Surveillance with Tom Keen, Jonathan Farrow, and Lisa Abramowitz. Good morning, everyone. Jonathan Farrell, Lisa Bramitz, and Tom Keen on radio, on television, on Monday. Equities, no. Commodities, no. Currencies, no. John Bonds. Price down, yield up. Again, yields up this morning. Two-year, 10-year, 30-year, 10-year at the moment. Back in the 460s, 30-year in the 470s. Congressman French Hill, 10 minutes ago, talking about, Tom, the recklessness in Washington and the contribution we've seen from that to this in the bond market right now. I don't disagree with that. And, you know, Lisa mentioned the interest payments on the national debt. But what's really front and center here, folks, this is very deceptive. You see us run banners of intraday highs in a yield and that. Forget about the spikes up, John. If you just look at the central price of a given bar chart, um, it, right now we are at new high levels for yield on a daily basis, not an intraday basis. It's been amazing to see over the last couple of weeks, last quarter, 70 basis point move. 70 basis points and change on a 10-year yield. Andrew Hollenhorst of City publishing just moments ago. Looking ahead to payrolls Friday, here's his number. 240,000 new jobs and a drop in the unemployment rate should confirm that growth remains solid, but with upside risk to inflation from tight labor markets. TK, which is why he's looking for another move from the Fed next month. And that's one view, and there's other views as well that cut the other way. The narratives that are out there, we've got to sort out. And as I said earlier, I've got October 6th. October 12th, October 13th, out to a November 1 meeting. I wonder what Jay Powell's going as for Halloween. What do you, what do you think? think? Ambiguity. Mortgage Ambi rates? No, he'll go for ambiguity, I think. That's Long, and variable variable lags. Lags. Long and variable that, lags. No, that, that, that's Yellen that's did that one. a couple of years ago. <laughs> <laughs> Anyways, November 1 is a Fed meeting. That's going to be an important date. But these key data points, yeah, I guess jobs matter, but I'm all inflation report. I'm sorry. I just, my main data point is the bond yield. At what yes. point does that shift up at such a high pace that something breaks? <clears throat> and this is the question, why are stocks not recognizing how quickly bond yields have gone up or have they? Is this something that everyone can adapt and adjust to at a time where we're leading to the highest yields that we've seen going right. back to 2007? This to me underscores the lack of a rally today after we did get okay. some resolution in Washington, DC. Over the weekend into Q4, Lisa, what's the spread market look like? I mean, there's all this doom and gloom in commercial real estate in that. What's the actual spread story? I will say that it is not a spread story. That what we heard there from Sonia Meskin was the exact opposite. This is a government bond story. This is a story about full faith and credit and the triple A rated company or the triple A rated sovereign debt that is the benchmark for all other borrowing costs. If you have an unmooring of that <clears throat> Something right. breaks. You could be unmooring, you could be unanchored, or you could just completely miss the call. I mean, we haven't even talked know, about I this. I know exactly where this John, is going. John, I'm an <laughs> idiot, and I don't understand offsides in soccer, and oh, I could right. tell that Liverpool Here? goal right. that. Okay. was a goal. Yes. That's impressive. I, I mean, this is the. It, they can't even get the rules right in English football. How do we expect the Fed to get the rules right? You should have heard the drama in the Bramo household. The yeah. screaming. There was, Liverpool fans over there. Yeah. Was Bob Michael, was he medicated? I'm sure Bob Michael yeah. was tremendously <laughs> upset about that. Um, the goal was onside. It, the yeah. video assistant referee knew it was onside, thought the referee had called it onside, realised too late. I say too late in their minds. They thought it was too yeah. late to go back and basically call it a goal, which is kind of bizarre. Right. Now there's all these talk about, you know, maybe replaying the game, which I find utterly ridiculous. These things happen really, all the I time. Really, I didn't know that. Uh, something, I'm it? sure the fan base would like it to happen, but I don't think that happens. Let's do an onside uh, data check right now. I'm going to go to the 10-year real yield. It is a fact. It is 2.27%. John, I can't say enough about yields up right through, right uh, 
right on resistance. Treasury's down and down hard over the last month, the last quarter, the last week. Four weeks of yields climbing on a 10-year. On a nominal yield, 463, yields up by six basis points. That's the 10-year maturity. On a 30-year, up by four or five basis points to about 475 currently. So yields up, dollar stronger, euro weaker. 105.30 on that currency pair, negative 0.4%. And crude, the rally continues even with that dollar strength, 91.20. WCI Tom up here by 0.4%. Equities just giving way, just a touch. To Lisa's point, that pop on equities after the resolution, if we can call it that, in Washington over the weekend, doesn't stick. It fades pretty quickly going Turn, into the opening bell. Yeah, we'll have to see in the opening bell. I'd like to get through to the end of October. David Leibowitz briefs this morning, global market strategist, JP Morgan, asset management. I love within your research note where we've come up to these levels and there's a huge now what? If I'm in a bond analysis of higher yields, how does it redound over to my analysis of the equity market? So I, I think what's so interesting is you, you talked about the dispersion of views. You talked about all of the things that are <clears throat> bothering the bond market today. With that type of uncertainty brewing, I mean, you'd argu arguably be looking for bond yields to move in the other direction, not continue to move higher. And I think that, to me, is what's a little bit unsettling about what's what's happening here. And equities continue to shrug it off for whatever reason. You know, the idea, but profit estimates for 2024 have been rising, which has been difficult for me to wrap my head around. And, you know, I would go back, Lisa, to, to what you were saying is if rates continue to rise the way that they've been rising, eventually there's going to be a financial accident. Eventually something is going to break. And that's the, what is going to get the Fed moving in the other direction. But it seems like the equity market still has this idea that the Fed's going to ease for easing sake in, in 2024. And I just I just can't get there. If things did break earlier this year, the financials did. Do you think they're well insulated now from what's developing in the Treasury market over the last three months? I think the, the larger institutions are well insulated. I think that there are probably still some problems in the small to medium banking space. Um, you know, what was so interesting about what happened back in March was not necessarily the event in and of itself. That's obviously been well covered, but the response from the Fed. And, and what did they do? Well, they injected liquidity into the system. Rates came back down. And, and look, we've baked those cupcakes before. We know what that does to the economy when you lower rates and inject liquidity. So that should have been the point in time when we all looked at each other and said, there's probably more legs to this expansion in this market rally than perhaps we thought coming into the year. But, you know, my view here is if, if rates, again, it's about the speed of the move in rates. And to your point about north of 70 bips last quarter, that's quite a quite a move. Which raises a question. You said something will break, but we've seen markets stop being markets. I could argue that the housing market is broken. Yep. It is not moving. People are buying new houses because nobody wants to move and no one wants to borrow at 8% rates. You're seeing that in corporate credit certain cuspy areas, and I know that's a jargonese phrase, but you see the more risky securities are not trading. There is a lack of liquidity underpinning this move. How closely are you tracking that? So I would add to the, the laundry list that you just laid out, if you look at amend and extend activity in the bank loan market, that's running at a pace that we haven't seen since the financial crisis. Auto delinquencies are up, credit card delinquencies are up. We're seeing a lot of signs that things are moving in not necessarily the most positive direction, but then you juxtapose it with the, the personal income report that we got on Friday, which showed that consumers are still out there spending away. And with 70% of the economy being the consumer, there's probably a little bit more room for this to run, but eventually you have to imagine the labor market begins to cool off. Is the new playbook the same as the old playbook? If eventually we're just going to basically boil this frog until something breaks, the Fed's going to step in with stimulus. You're going to end up with lower yields, which turbocharges the next leg of the, of, the, of, the, of the rally. I mean, why not just get long at stocks and expect the Fed to bail you out? So I think the reason that we would be hesitant to embrace too much risk in portfolios today is that if that boiling the frog scenario does play out, there is downside risk to growth and there's downside risk to corporate profits. And so we would view equities as needing to pull back in the event of that materializing. But right. I, I don't think you're completely wrong. You know, if the Fed responds by lowering rates, I'm not sure that they're going to do a whole lot of QE. I don't think that there's appetite for that. But, you know, investors at some point here will get exactly what they're looking for, which is easier policy. James Diamond will be with our Emily Chen this morning, his mandate, which he will show as a more longer term perspective. All of this is great short termism. At JP Morgan, with a three year perspective, what do you do with equities? So what do you do with equities? I think you avoid the names that have driven the rally so far this year from a pricing perspective. Do you they sell just them or do you avoid them? I don't think you sell them. I just don't think you I walk you, you into put... your shop with Microsoft shares. I've been lucky. They've been a moonshot. You're telling me to sell them? No, I'm telling you that that's not where the incremental dollar should go today. I think that you need to focus on valuation in this type of environment because the securities that are looking overextended from a valuation 
valuation perspective, arguably stand to fall the furthest. I also think that there continues to be a tremendous opportunity in fixed income. And you know, you look at two-year, five-year, ten-year paper. Not that I would do that with my entire portfolio, but taking advantage and locking in some of those yields today, even if there maybe is still some upside on the ten-year, doesn't feel like the worst playbook from from my view. I think you need to think about managing risk in this environment, not just going for the most return. Well, let's talk about sectors right now within equities. Avoid maybe tech. What do you like at the moment? So it's it's an interesting barbell that that we're embracing today. On the one hand, we like the more defensive dividend payers, so the consumer staples names, the utilities names. I know that they've been under pressure due to the rate story, but I do think that they will pay off. You know, over the course of a nine to twelve month horizon, we also like energy. And you look at what's happening with oil prices today. Energy is obviously highly cyclical, but you look at the shift that we've seen in the underlying approach that these companies are taking to managing their businesses. They're focused on capital efficiency. They're f- focused on returning cash to shareholders. These are completely different from the private equity, private equity-backed businesses that we saw in the early 2010s, where it was about how much volume can you pull out of the ground. They're actually now focused on profits, and profits are going to be key if multiples come under pressure. Last month it was energy versus discretionary. Energy up, discretionary really suffered. Had a terrible month in September. Great year so far still up for 2023. That confidence you have for energy, do you match that with some bearishness around discretionary? I do. I I think that the reality is that the consumer is beginning to come under pressure. And there are different estimates of all of this. If you look at the Fed's numbers, the excess saving ran out over the course of the summer. You look at the savings rate, it continues to run well below its long run average. Credit card debt is up, although consumer leverage, if you normalize it based on income, is only back to where it was pre-COVID. It's my, my impression here is that the consumer is very much in the process of bending rather than breaking. But in that type of environment, discretionary is in a place where I want to hang my hat. Terrible for some of the airlines over the last month or so. Lisa, absolutely brutal for some of those names. Higher oil prices, people pushing back on prices, and you see that the most in the airlines that cater to families and to people going on vacations and less to international business geared kind of travel. JetBlue. Yeah, that's basically what I'm talking about. And, and what I think is so interesting about that is if you listen to, if you listen to the management teams, they only raise their prices if they think the demand is there. Right. And what we're seeing in the airlines where they've had that pricing power is that demand is beginning to fade. I think it dovetails nicely with the overall view on the consumer. I was top tier JetBlue, David, for a long time, and they didn't carry over my, you were. my privileges. Yeah. That's, that's who I'd fly domestic with for business travel. Really? In the US, yes. Where'd you go? Miami? West Coast. Really? West Coast, JetBlue. Interesting. And the mint offering was decent, and then we came out of the pandemic, and Mr. Hayes would not push well, over my, push my privileges now. for 12 months. So, yeah. you know, we did that live on air. Yeah. He said I should fly more, so I didn't. <laughs> David, thank you. <laughs> David Leverts of JP Morgan. Welcome to the program. If you're just tuning in, the S&P 500 negative here by 0.15%. My favorite line on the airlines this over the weekend. United Airlines would save $80 million a year of the average passenger weight yeah, I saw that. <laughs> found by 10 pounds. Jim Bianco, I think, reading minds out there at the moment. You know those slaughterhouse type scales? Jim Bianco of Bianco Research said, imagine those scales at the airport that you and your bags have to step on if over a certain weight your credit <laughs> yeah. card is charged. That would do wonders for public relations. Well, the, the it's another Azempic trade. That's somebody, what this is. That's not but there's something. somebody in front of it, me is. checking six suitcases into these ginormous suitcases. And I guess they pay extra for it. But at some point, the beast can't get off the ground. <laughs> well, I mean, you pay extra for the suitcases, but that would not really look good right. when you have people basically going on the scale and they have like a meat scale and then they have like, you know, Why are you looking a number at should, that starts going up. We should get the analyst from Jefferies on this. This is real Southside research, uh-huh. okay? And we should have this conversation about how they envision it working. Is this just a benefit of a Zempic that the average passenger weight will fall by 10 pounds? The side effects are real and I'm just curious about, you know, this is what well, we're people hearing. People throwing up on the plane. <laughs> <laughs> People are eating their breakfast, John. But the side effects to Ozempic need to be explored before we could start trading around the entire would, economy on that. T- All my radar is up. Maybe I agree. people are. I'm not, full disclosure, I'm not doing Ozempic or whatever it's called. <laughs> okay, thanks for that disclosure. <laughs> no, she, why are you laughing, David? Stop it. <laughs> All eyes turn to the U.S. job market. The jobs report, it beckons. It looks like companies are just holding on, holding on, holding on to workers. What you see is what you get. We're seeing a lot of strength. This Friday, Tom, Jonathan, Lisa, and Mike will bring you crucial data and expert analysis at terminal speed. This is exactly what the Fed is looking for. They now believe you can get back to 2%. 
without damaging the labor market at all. We might get a bigger whammy than we expected. The September Jobs Report, Friday on Bloomberg Television and Radio. Senator, you just voted for a short-term deal that doesn't include a cent yeah. for Ukraine yeah. nor for the U.S. border. Right. How did you swallow that? We had to keep the government open. We got 45 days to fix both problems. Uh, I, I listened to Kevin closely. Uh, there will come out of the Senate soon a bill that will have three legs to it. I believe there's bipartisan support in the Senate to do both and it will go to the House hopefully in the next 30 days. That's the next big effort, the deadline, November 17th. Senator Lindsey Graham of South Carolina speaking on CBS just yesterday. If you are just joining us, welcome to the program. Counting you down to the opening bow for Q4, one hour and about 13 minutes away. Equity futures negative here by 0.2% on the S&P after falling last week, last month and last quarter. Hello Q4 with the yields higher again by six basis points. Tom, your 10-year, 4.63. 51. I'm looking, I like Kitschuk's where he says currency is trumped up by bonds. I, I think that's a really interesting concept, you, you know, to get into October where bonds frankly really matter more. Oh, yields up dollar stronger. Yeah. Story of the last three months. Yeah. I'm looking at the real yield, 2.28% really has my attention, a five basis point uh, move. We're going to pause here for 45 seconds. Lisa, John, and I, there was a point where we literally didn't see each other for months and months with COVID, and we determined with our producers, with our team, that we had to cover COVID. John, we did it with Imperial College London, Johns Hopkins, Johns Hopkins, Johns Hopkins University, and their science, and you see it today in the Nobel Prize. This is to the University of Pennsylvania, and John, this goes back to Watson and Crick in the 60s, to David Baltimore, and recombinant DNA, to this miracle of the three of us walking into an office, and we get a shot. And you say, well, it'll be a big deal, and I make jokes about it. These are the people that made the Pfizer shot. And this is a triumph for all the voices we talked to. That news out this morning, Tom. Congratulations to Catalin Carrico and Drew Weissman. Just a huge, huge deal. I can't say enough about it and to our team for our coverage through COVID. Uh, and frankly, you know, we may have more coverage. I'm seeing more masks right now. The Nobel yeah. Prize in... Yeah physiology or medicine for 2023. Yeah, and well, it's mRNA. This is a huge deal going back 50 years and really well deserved for the whole scientific community. Knowing that as Jeanette Lowe, Director of Policy Research at Strategas, because if we had shut down, we probably would have shut down our science complex across our federal government as well. Jeanette Lowe, we did not shut down. Medicine will move forward. Science will move forward. Ukraine won't move forward. As Senator Graham talked about, do you just see an easy path to legislation where the United States of America provides ammunition to Ukraine? Yeah, this does not look like an easy path at all. The, obviously, it was a little bit of a surprise that they, there was no government shutdown. We did not expect Speaker McCarthy to actually cross his caucus and work with the Democrats to pass a bill to keep the government open. So we don't have a shutdown yet. We might have another shutdown risk come November 17th. And we still have a tough road to hoe here until then. So we still have to figure out what we're going to do on Ukraine funding. We still have to pass a budget. And then I Republicans really do want to do something about the southern border. And so it's still going to be a, a, a bit of a tough uh, leg here where they really still have to figure things out. And Speaker McCarthy is going to see some challenges to his speakership probably as soon as this week. And he could see multiple ones of those over the next couple of months, which is going to make it really difficult to be governing in Washington. What I find interesting, Jeanette, is that everyone we're talking to today speaks as though House Speaker uh, Kevin McCarthy will still be in that position in the months to come, albeit with some uh, uh, some consternation with certain parts of his uh, his committee, his, his team. How much are you looking at the possibility that he does not remain speaker for the foreseeable future? So we think that he can't uh, um, pass this first vote. So we think, you know, the initial vote that's going to come up, we think that there will be an effort to save his speakership. Um, it might be that Democrats vote for him. It could be more likely that Democrats actually just don't show up for the vote or vote presence, so that it gives him a smaller margin to actually reach that threshold and remain speaker. However, we don't necessarily anticipate that that's the end of the story. We think you could see a continued votes brought up. Um, it could be over a couple of weeks. And eventually that might start to wear down the process and figure out, you know, that he ultimately may not be able to survive the speakership long term. 
The problem is, of course, that they do need an alternative, and the alternative still has the exact same Republican caucus that they need to manage. And so they're still going to have these small number of hardcore members who are going to be pushing for um, holding out on spending bills and other priorities that they have. And that makes it a lot more difficult to for the moderate wing of the party to be able to get things done as well. So it's still going to be, regardless of who is speaker, it's still going to be a very difficult uh, path moving forward. I'm trying to be an optimist here that we're not just doing deja vu. All over again on November 17th and how much are we looking at something anything that actually got done other than just kicking the can down the road so um, you obviously they needed more time right so we needed a continuing resolution regardless because they were never going to get appropriations done we do have six weeks now so that's a little bit of a, a good piece um, you know there's efforts not to have it move into December we could always see another CR that moves into December but at some point they need to kind of take this big vote and we do need to pass a budget and there's a lot of moderate members who really do want to get that done so what we're going to be looking for is what happens over the next couple of weeks we think that it's going to be kind of a volatile process but there is still the push probably that's going to happen where we're going to have an omnibus bill mm -hmm. where we're going to ultimately get a budget done. You're going to put a bunch of other provisions in there. We might see something on immigration, see something on Ukraine funding. If it gets pushed even further into the end of the year, might you might see right. even more things added in there. Um, but they do have to probably get something done, especially before they move into the 2024 year when it's an election year and you have election politics playing a part. Uh, Jeanette, you mentioned migration earlier. The raging debate is a GOP issue. I don't buy it for a minute. I see Democrats nationwide adapting and adjusting. What will be the Democratic Party path on migration in the next 90 days? So right now, the Democrats are saying that they are, you know, kind of pushing against some of these changes to who can come through the border, having people being able to stay in the United States while their asylum um, cases are being heard rather than being having to be held in Mexico or held in another country. Um, but you are seeing immigration have an impact across the country, and you have a lot of Democratic cities and states that are also having to deal with a large influx. So at some point, there is an opportunity, I think, for a bipartisan compromise. You're just probably not going to hear it as much from the members of um, the progressive wing in the Democratic Party in Congress. But I do think that you're hearing more conversations about there has to be some changes that are going to be made. And there is an effort, you know, you had Senator Cinema from Arizona trying to put forward some um, moves to come up with a bipartisan solution here. And eventually, you know, if you want kind of Ukraine funding and something on the border, that does create a nice bipartisan mix. And there might be something that we can get done ultimately. Jeanette, do you expect that Democrats in certain states are going to start to sound like conservatives on certain issues. Congressman French Hill was with us about 30 minutes ago and he made a point, and I'm paraphrasing here, that the border issue was every state's issue now, that every state essentially was on the southern border. Do you think that's going to change the politics domestically going into next year's election? I do. I mean, I think that you are starting to see some tensions within the party on that. You have um, Democratic policymakers who are in charge of cities or of states that are having to deal with the immigration um, flux and the sheer numbers of how many people that they're trying to deal with and then process and, and get onto you know, a better place. And that's creating tension with the administration that they're not potentially going to be doing enough. They're not providing enough aid to the states. And so you are starting to see the tension there. The rhetoric may not change as much, but I do think that there is going to be more of a uh, thought to be a little bit more maybe say practical and saying you know we have these large numbers of people who are coming to the country we actually aren't even able to manage them so we do need to make some changes and it's going to probably play into electoral politics next year so democrats also have to think about what are people seeing on the ground and how does that issue then impact them they can't just ignore the fact that there are cities that are struggling with these new um, influxes of people and that's going to be important to take into consideration change of tone has been amazing Jeanette Lowe a strategist a bad company Jeanette thank you change of tone from Governor Kathy Hochul here in New York virtue you signaling a few years ago Tom was free it has a price now that's for sure I, I totally agree and I don't think it's just New York City I think it's really across the nation it's absolutely original a life from New York City. The opening bell about an hour away. Equity futures negative 0.2%.
Bloomberg Surveillance 8.30 economic data, not on a Monday, October 1 or 2 or whatever it is. It's October well. 2nd. John Farrow, uh, in, you know, he's, he's like deep into the 9 a.m. show uh, right now. No economic data, but I guess it's a big deal later on this morning. We've got ISM manufacturing, ISM. and 15 minutes before that, we get S&P uh, Global U.S. Manufacturing PMIs. And this comes at a time where people are looking at new strength in manufacturing as people shift and strength back. strength and yield, too. Well, and that's part of what's underpinning it because you're sort of not seeing that altogether downturn that people were expecting. Uh, yeah, and rounded up, 150, we're not there yet, 149.74. Lots of tea leaves here in an October uh, Monday to uh, get acquainted with. One of them just came in off the transom. David Rosenberg, Toronto, Canada, reminding us that 2.2% is the three-month annualized inflation statistic for America. Many would disagree with that. And then there's a basic idea as we launch into Q4, are we fighting the last war? Michael McKee knows this is something we're very good at. Let's talk fighting the last war, October 2023 <laughs> at Vintage. Is Rosenberg right that we just, you know, we're looking back and looking at high inflation everywhere and just saying worry, worry narrative, except Disinflation. Well, I don't think the Fed's doing that. They're looking at the same numbers as David is, and they're doing the annualizations as David is. It's really a question of does this continue? Uh, they know that they have made a lot of progress on inflation, and if you're looking at the PCE numbers right now and extrapolating out no change in the monthly uh, gain, you're looking at 3.3 to 3.5 percent uh, for the PCE core at the end of the year, and the Fed was forecasting 3.7. So things may be better than anticipated. But I think the the markets tend to want to fight the last war, or at least prepare for the damages that could come if the last war reasserted itself. Is there any indication that you get from which Fed speakers speak and where they speak? And we were talking about this, that Fed Chair Jay Powell, alongside uh, Philadelphia Fed President Patrick Harker, are going to be speaking with small business owners and consumers who might be feeling higher rates more than others. Does that tell you anything? I don't think so. I think, uh, you know, there's a, a choice to talk to the small business owners and uh, maybe they made this uh, because they want to deliver a kind of a hopeful message to people. But uh, most Fed speeches like or things like this are planned well in advance. So I don't think there's a specific message that they want to deliver other than things are getting better and we're on the job. Well, there's also a feeling right now baked into market expectations that we are seeing, given the fact that we're going to get data on Friday, the reason for the Fed to go again in November to raise rates. And that seems to be part of what's underpinning the bond move. Do you think that the data that we have seen, other than David Rosenberg's point of view, has justified under the Fed's circumstances, an additional rate hike? I don't think it has so far. This is why this is such an interesting week, starting with the ISM manufacturing today. Everybody will look to the prices paid and employment sub-indexes to see what it's telling us about what's going on. And then you have a number of other employment indicators mm -hmm. this week. You have durable goods. We'll see how businesses' investments are going. And then, of course, the jobs report on Friday. And all that will feed into the jobs report on Friday. So we may see some changes in what the forecast are. But right now, it doesn't look like there's yeah. any reason necessarily for them to go. But I did think it was interesting. If you if you take a look at the uh, chart of the November 1st Fed futures. Uh, Where the, is it right now? Uh, the, well, they went uh, on Friday. They were at about 15 yeah. percent because we thought the government would shut down. As of today, it's over 30 percent. It was, a, yeah. you know, it's one of those uh, hockey sticks up because people all of a sudden, well, oh, well, now we, yeah. <laughs> now we could have a problem. Just possibly fighting the last war. Michael McKee, thank you so much. Lisa, quickly, the yields, 5.10%, six basis points in the two-year, six basis points to a 464 in the 10-year. I'm watching the 30-year, 30-year, 4.75. Are we getting near an 8% 30-year mortgage? We're looking at some of the highest levels that we've seen for mortgage rates even further back, right, right? more than two decades. At what point, again, I keep going back to this, at what point do risk assets fully price this in or have they? Because right now, that is one of the biggest debates on Wall Street. It is October. Too many people are out there going, where are my kids going to go to school and will the faculty be competent? Every once in a while, you throw your kid to a school like University of Virginia and they work for a rock star. Joining us now is Michael Puglisi, senior economist at Wells Fargo. And as we advance to November in the 60th anniversary of an event that changed my life, the assassination of John F. Kennedy, 
This is a kid at UVA who helped Larry Sabato do the definitive book on JFK in 50 years forward. Michael Puglisi, before we get to the economics, what was it like helping the acclaimed professor write this 50-year treatise on JFK? Yeah, well, thanks for having me, Tom. And it was, a, it was a great experience working with Professor Sabato on that project. I mean, not just the book, but the documentary. You know, I wasn't around for uh, the Kennedy presidency, and so I got to learn a ton about what that was like and the impact it had on politics, not just at the time, but as it resonated, you know, 60-plus years on the, the echo his presidency had on the United States. We've got an echo of economics now. The impact of politics right now on Wells Fargo economics. Do you ignore the shutdown and all the rest of this foolishness, or do you have to fold it into your Excel spreadsheet? Well, you don't have a choice but to fold it in. I think the encouraging thing for the Fed as they go to that November meeting we were just discussing is it looks like they're going to get their economic data, right? There, it seemed like going into the weekend there was a good chance we'd wake up today, no jolts report, no jobs report, maybe no CPI report next week. And now it looks like the Fed is going to have that and they've staved off the economic uh, hit from a shutdown for at least another you know, six or seven weeks or so. That said, there is this profound dysfunction that starts to creep up and in, into bond yields. And we were talking about that uh, with Sonia Meskin earlier this morning. What is the concern that you have, that we are concerned about weakness on some level, that this is not a rip-roaring economy, and that any concern, whether it's about a government shutdown or weakness elsewhere, is not being felt in longer-term bond yields that keep going up? Yeah, it's been surprising. I mean, given all the headwinds the economy is facing, right, the Fed that remains so hawkish, the student loan payments restarting, fears of a shutdown, the UAW strikes. I mean, the list just seems to go on and on. And that's just in the United States, let alone a recession in Europe and elsewhere. But I do think it makes a little bit of sense, just given what's happened over the past couple months on the fiscal front and the supply front. You've seen deficits that just keep widening. They look like they're going to be 6 to 7 percent of GDP for the foreseeable future. At the same time, the Fed's quantitative easing, or quantitative tightening, rather, is adding bonds to the market on a monthly basis at a pretty steady clip with no end in sight. So I think maybe finally you're starting to see some term premium come back into the market, at least, at least until we see more meaningfully weak economic data. Well, how much then do you have to factor this into uh, some of your economic projection? Does this slow growth, in other words, on, some, uh, on a more sustainable basis simply because there is going to be a term premium, there is going to be a question about whether the U.S. government can keep paying the interest payments with the same debt load that they're looking at, and it questions fiscal uh, expenditures going forward. Yeah. I mean, the way I think about it is when you start to get to this position in the cycle, this position of monetary policy stance, the economy just, it only has so much more forward momentum. I mean, where's the growth going to be in 2024? I think it's going to be very challenging. Monetary policy acts with a lag, rates more broadly act with a lag, and that's why we've got a recession in our forecast still for the first half of the next year, whether it's high, higher oil prices, the student loan payments restarting, these much higher yields, the higher mortgage rates we discussed a moment ago. I think all those factors are going to come together to really constrain growth next year. Where are your stars that you're following? We started this show talking about how there are a lot of stars in a cloudy sky and we're going to try to find them and yeah. some of these metaphors that aren't working for me at a time when we just don't have the data and everyone seems like they're really uncertain. What are you trying yeah. to follow? What's yeah. your load star? Yeah, the navigators are always looking to the stars for the right direction, right? I mean, to me, you know, the way I think about it is what's the Fed looking for at a fundamental level? They're looking for slower inflation, a continuation of that, you know, 2.2 percent three-month annualized core inflation rate that we've had over the past few months, continuing that into next year. And they're looking at the labor market and saying, so far, we haven't seen any meaningful pain. Job growth is slowed, but it's still at 150,000 jobs a month or so. Unemployment's below 4 percent. And that's what's going to drive the reaction function is one, the inflation data and realizing that continued slowdown, and two, do we realize any economic pain, particularly on the labor market front over the yeah. six months? That, to me, is what's really going to drive the bus. Well, final question here, Michael. That's it, and it's the heart of Wells Fargo's research and heritage. Back to John Silva. When does the unemployment rate finally jump? I see no evidence. Yeah, it takes time. Right. If you look back to 2008 and that tightening cycle, the last hike occurred in June 2006. You didn't see a recession start until December 2007. That was 18 months later. And of course, we're not forecasting any kind of you know, deep economic downturn like we had back then. Right. But I think it serves as a reminder that even after that last hike, 
which we may not even have had yet, uh, it takes time for that policy tightness to filter through to the real economy and actually generate the, the, the slowdown that you're referencing, Tom. Do you have a Fed prediction for November 1? I don't think they're going to hike. I think that what you're going to see over the next month is a continuation of the trend in the data we've seen. 150,000 jobs a month is where we're at for Friday. I think something along the lines of another 0.2 or so on core CPI. And as long as we realize that data, I think it'll be enough to hold them off for the next meeting. Michael, thank you so much. Michael Puglisi of Wells Fargo and at the University of Virginia, I can't say enough about this book. This book got rave reviews about the 50-year reach after the assassination of the president, the Kennedy F. Century, Larry Sabato. I'm going to give a co-write there to Michael Puglisi. It's not there because he was a lowly, you know, undergraduate student who cared. But the Kennedy F. Century, he had a lot to do with that informed uh, book. John Grisham, among others, gave it a rave at review. Isn't that cool, Lisa? Like, you go to school, and I, I did the research thing and was hugely advantaged. Nothing as big as that. But nobody ever talks about when you get lucky and you have a faculty member who's a rock star and, you know, you're bouncing off them. Do you have memories of rock star yeah, faculty? My, my, my uh, freshman advisor at Colorado was George Gamow's son, Igor Gamow, who's the number one guy in the world on how snakes tell the temperature with their tongue. True story. I went in his lab once, because <laughs> the <laughs> Never whole thing, again. Just lots of snakes. it stunk, and it had snake smell, and the whole thing was surrounded by snakes, a few of which I really didn't want to get. Yeah. Which... I went and saw my faculty advisor <laughs> once. <laughs> and after that, he bought snake, snake skin, um, snake skin docks, otherwise, uh, <laughs> not so much, not doing that. You know, that, that's, that's what you get, but for Michael Puglisi to do that with Larry Sabato is just really... Really, really cool. We're going to really dive into bond analysis here. It's important. Let's look at some of the other stuff as well. Dollar elevated. I got a yen, 149.76. Really important in their Tuesday evening uh, tonight. Equities, I got red on the screen, on the screen, 18.33 on the VIX. In the commodity space, Daniel Jurgen with Yousef over in Abu Dhabi, really good. 92.70. Oils, you know, maybe a little bit diminished from where uh, we were. The Standard & Poor's 500 down two-tenths of a percent. Tom, we really do have to pick up on what we're seeing in bonds right yeah. now, because particularly the 10-year, and this is coming on the long end, uh, we're seeing it really pop up back towards some of the highs that we haven't seen since 2007, 4.639%. Why? Wow. Is this because essentially you're going to get the economic data, you're not going to get the slowdown that some people were predicting from, an, uh, from a government shutdown, so suddenly people are gaming out higher rates for longer I, to an even greater degree? Uh, is that what's going on? I, I totally take the ambiguity, the mystery of your why, in that technically these charts are really, really elegant. The fact is, give you, take your yield, 10-year, whatever, 30-year, we're moving out. And this is critical, folks. Why, why don't you see red headlines across the Bloomberg? We do intraday analysis across all of Bloomberg LP on bonds. But on a daily pricing, as we speak, on many of these yields, we're out to a new high, rounded up U.S. 10-year yield 2.28%. Moments ago, rounded up 2.29%. So one uh, viewer wrote into me who is really smart saying that this is not so much. We have smart uh, viewers. We have yes. very smart viewers that are smarter than I. And uh, they were talking about how this is essentially a buyer strike that there are people interested in these bonds. We yep. heard about that from David Leibovitz. They want to capture these yields, but you don't want to catch a falling knife. And right now there feels like there's something else going on. To me, this is really the question. Yeah. When do we get that buying activity? What does it take? Does it take something breaking? Does it take some sort of right. you know, bigger J Japanese and move? If John Farrow was here, he's out at his St. Regis breakfast this morning. Very fancy. John Farrow would look at the German 30-year bond enjoying a 3% yield. That is untenable in Germany. Stay with us all through October. This is Bloomberg Surveillance. The big issue that people are not talking about in the oil market is the strength of non non-OPEC plus oil, the growth in the United States this year is a million barrels a day. Brazil, Canada, Canada is going to grow half a million barrels a day next year. And so it's basically is that the non-OPEC non, non 
OPEC plus oil is growing faster than demand. That's the factor that goes unremarked in the discussion about oil prices. Non, non OPEC plus. I can't really Only get my Daniel head Gergen around just exactly what we're talking about. Daniel Gerrigan, uh, as be a global vice chair with a long trajectory and incredible uh, academic credentials when it comes to the oil market. We are looking at oil as sort of another one of the shoes in this toxic brew. And I can't even say that with a straight face anymore. That's leading yields to go that much higher. Our focus very much on the yield picture this morning, Tom. We've been talking all morning about the fact that even with the triumph of the government reopening, we are seeing risk I, off and we are seeing bond yields up. I'm going to state some, some, something's going on here, folks. It's a Monday. We're slipping into October. We had a beautiful Sunday in New York. Finally, nobody's focused. Get focused now because the markets are talking and they're talking price down, uh, yield up. No question about it. When you take a look at the specific names, you're not really seeing that much more of any kind of direction. Let's just be really honest. We're in sort sure. of pre-earnings churn as people try to game out what's going to happen with October 13th, J.P. Morgan coming out. But I did want to look at the consumer discretionary, in particular cruise lines, since we love cruise liners here on surveillance. And you can see uh, just that leg lower, again, with Carnival and Norwegian and pre-market trading down more than 1% Why? on both of those. Honestly, I'm curious about consumer discretionary at a time where you are seeing some signs of stress. You are seeing borrowing costs going up in surveys. People do feel bad. They are recognizing the inflationary outlook. Gas prices are going up. So for these cruise lines, you've got expenses going up and you've got a real uh, pushback a little bit more potentially for uh, the prices for passing it along in the consumer prices. So I keep watching the consumer discretionary from that vantage point. And then Deutsche Bank, those shares lower by almost 1% uh, after news came out this morning about the German financial watchdog uh, Boffin basically saying it has appointed an independent monitor to oversee Deutsche Bank's progress in resolving uh, some well. of its... Uh, some of its issues. Our work on Jane Fraser here, and I mean, there's been a little bit of a rebound in uh, Citibank off of 4.00. Uh, the low was, excuse me, three, $3.99 on Citigroup, reverse 10 split. We've bounced back up, but I'm sorry. The banks, as I mentioned throughout all the show today, are worth watching. Well, they're worth watching because on one hand, they should benefit from higher rates. They've been talking about this for a while, but if they're crimped by regulation yeah. and if they're crimped by the pace of the move up, really torpedoing a uh, market act activity that creates a problem. Yeah, and you were seeing I got a 2.29% up 6 basis points on the 10-year real yield. I'm sorry. There's something going on here is all I got to say about it. Right now, I definitely want to get a sense of the look forward, especially heading into uh, the October 13th sphere. Gina Martin Adams joining us now, our equity guru over at Bloomberg Intelligence, overseeing all of the incredible research that you guys put out. Are you surprised that people keep upgrading some of the earnings forecasts? Um, I am and I'm not. The, the nature of the earnings growth forecast is not particularly surprising because a lot of it has come from <clears throat> last year's weakest players starting to recover this year. Recall there's this sort of uh, disconnect between the earnings se series and the economic data where last year earnings went into a full recession. Maybe the economy did or did not. The economy apparently held its own. We have not heard that we were in recession, but the earnings were in a very deep recession. This year has been about a, an emerging recovery from that earnings recession for certain sectors, in particular the biggest five stocks, which are now producing net income growth of nearly 30 percent year over year to substantiate that rotation. We're also seeing consumer discretionary, as you alluded to earlier, consumer discretionary earnings growth powering forward and upgrades continuing in that space. On the other end of the spectrum, though, you've got consumer staples where earnings downgrades continue to pressure that space. Expectations are even lower. So if there is some consumer distress, it's mostly in the day-to-day, -day, lower income earning consumer um, focused groups, the staples are actually experiencing greater distress than discretionary, discretionary right now. So there are a lot of moving parts in the earnings stream some of which have been surprising, right. some of which have simply just reflected where we've been and the recovery that we've had, which is entirely about inflation. And inflation okay. really pressuring earnings last year is, has become less of an, a problem this we, year. We all have our narratives in securities analysis. We have our narratives as well. It's something I talked about in the last hour. Gina Martin Adams, you're sitting down with 40 of our best and brightest in equities, and you say, look, we're fighting the last war intellectually. 
How do we get beyond October 1 from the emotion of the last 12 months to clear thinking for the yeah. next 12 months? Uh, we become incredibly data and model <clears throat> dependent, right? A lot of the, what's happened, I think, in the equity markets is sort of behavioral where our sensitivity well said, to yeah. various macro yeah, components, yeah. our sensitivity to rates, our concern overwhelms the reality of what's happened in the data. And if, you're, if you become incredibly data-centric, if you become very data-dependent, you get out of your own head, get out of your own narrative, you do find that there are rational movements in the equity markets, but you do have to spend a lot of time digging through the data and digging beneath the top line. The S&P 500 is in this just fascinating state right now where the top five have driven all of the positive price performance. Most people think that that's some sort of irrational <clears throat> exuberance around you know, the top right. five stocks. But frankly, the top five are the earning components of the S&P 500. There's a rational argument for this when these stocks are driving 30% right. earnings growth while the rest of the okay. index is still in earnings contraction. So we're fighting the last war, which is all behavioral. I think totally agree with you on that. And if we've got to get back to data, you and I are going to stack. It's Monday, so we're not doing a five ratio DuPont. We're only doing a three ratio DuPont. You get to wait until Wednesday for that. And I'm sorry, I'm going over to the right side of the three ratio DuPont. Forget about the details, folks. Leverage and operating yeah. leverage okay. is the big underestimation of, say, Microsoft. Discuss internal operating yeah. leverage is a positive catalyst yeah. away from behavior. Oh, I think this is an absolutely huge point right now because this goes back to what I was talking about earlier, where inflation really depleted the ability of companies to perform over the course of last year. Inflation created a lot of disturbances in 2022, most importantly on the margin lines. So when you talk about that operating leverage, as the companies experienced a slight deceleration in volume sales, they experienced a really big escalation in cost pressure. And many of the companies reacted, right? We had very big jobless claims. We had very big losses in uh, layoff, or increases in layoffs. We started to see the unemployment rate tick a little bit higher finally this year. But this is really what happened last year. Now you're starting to see these companies really benefit from these behaviors and a decreasing cost of inputs. You're seeing the input costs decelerate even more than revenues are decelerating for many of these companies. And that's resulting in this leverage, which is creating the, the earnings recovery. Given that, does it make sense to you that consumer staples are doing so poorly? Yeah, because consumer staples are underappreciated for their inflation sensitivity. This is one of the most inflation sensitive sectors in the S&P 500. They obviously, right, you think, okay, what does a grocery store's cost? Well, a lot of that is the cost of goods. It's the cost that it's coming into the store. If the cost of cereal is up precipitously <laughs> and the consumer is going to shift down to non-branded cereal items, that materially impacts a grocery, a grocery store. The same for especially the dollar stores, the dollar generals, the dollar stores of the world are very sensitive to what happens at the pump. So this reacceleration we've had over the last couple of months in oil prices and gas prices precipitously impacts that segment of the world. Right. So a lot of this makes sense because it's about inflation and it's about the consumer response right. to inflation and how that is shifting over time. It's creating a lot more volatility for consumer staples than I think a lot of investors right. would like to acknowledge, but it is absolutely I, impacting I, I've got to get this I mean, Farrell's got 8,000 shares of Birkenstock coming, and I know Gina, I can just see, can you see Gina wearing the wool Birkenstock Boston? What is the problem with Birks? <laughs> I mean, like, yeah, what really? is the obsession? I, I, could, I don't I understand say, it. They are perfectly I, good sandals. I, I agree. I, I, I got to go back Thank to you. a Birkenstock question, you know, way, way back when we were looking at dead reissues. Gina Martin Adams on the re-advent of LIFO FIFO. Okay. Which sector is best benefited by life of FIFO. Yeah, it's most I'm impactful. Just this this is I know. Yeah, you're really crushing I'm fully me. aware. <laughs> this is it's, incredible. Inventory is most <laughs> impactful in the materials and industrial space. Actually, it's not as much in the consumer space, but it is in the in the retailers. Retailers are certainly impacted. But when you look at services, are they companies, benefited? Are is Walmart benefited by a new life of FIFO analysis? They could be benefiting in 2023. Could be wearing yeah. clogs right now. Now this inventory is crushed. <laughs> okay, that was low. <laughs> I'm going to take this seriously. Yeah. Yeah, please. That's really the only It's right. just to keep plowing through. <laughs> Inventories really <laughs> crushed the retailers, in particular Walmart and Target, last year. Right, last year that was a big story. Remember, in the summer months, we had all these write-offs even from Walmart and Target because inventories were incredibly right. problematic. It is actually helping to some degree to have had those write-offs. There we last go. Year. It's a life of five of pop. <laughs> we got to go because Jamie Dimon's what? more important than Gina Martin Adams. Ten o'clock today, James Dimon in London with our Emily Chang. An important discussion: the tech advantage at J.P. Morgan Chase. 
Tune in tomorrow if you choose. <laughs> this is Blue Birds. Life of Birkenstocks. <laughs>